which will be packed full of exciting presentations, updates, information, and most importantly, a chance to connect together with our whole ecosystem, which I'll get to a bit later. My name is Kevin Stanley, and I have the pleasure of leading off this four-day summit, including eight vertical expos, 10-plus keynote speakers, and over 160 startup presentations. So don't move a muscle or you may miss something. Today will consist of two parts. The first, focus around one of our oldest programs, Internet of Things, followed by our real estate and construction program, which is seeing a revolution play out right before our eyes, especially in how we all use our office space. Now, let's dive right into the first part, Internet of Things. The rough agenda is as follows. I'll share a few updates regarding some new initiatives here at Plug and Play, share a few words from our corporate partners, and then announce our corporate award winner. After, we'll hear from all startups from our IoT Batch 13. This will be broken up by mini panel discussions where you will have the chance to submit questions via the Q&A button on Zoom. After all of the startup presentations, we're excited to have an IoT alumni company share their success story with us, which will wrap up our IoT portion. Our real estate construction program will then take over, but make sure you're back to meet us on Remo to connect with these presenting companies between one and three o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Now, I'd like to share a few of these exciting new initiatives we've recently launched. With the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University and the OCP Group, we have launched an open innovation hub in Morocco. This new location is Plug and Play's first office in Africa, with a plan to, to make Morocco the premier destination of startups in the surrounding regions. Plug and Play Morocco's first batch is scheduled to begin in January 2021 out of Startgate, North Africa's largest startup facility located in the university's campus We'll have an initial focus on smart cities. This partnership will help startups across Morocco and the African continent gain access to plug and play's network of corporations and venture capitalists, giving them support to expand and grow their businesses globally, but also a new market for our corporate partners to explore. Prior to the start of the program in January, Plug and Play Morocco is organizing a series of innovation sessions around 10 different topics. Each session will be led by an industry expert and startup mentor who will give a keynote followed by pitches from startups offering solutions in those areas. These sessions will be the perfect venue to learn more about corporate innovation and discuss with experts in each of those fields. I know there's a lot of information here, so I'd like to highlight two that I'm particularly excited to see. The first on corporate innovation on November 24th, and the second on mobility and logistics on November 25th. If there's any interest to learn more about Plug and Play Morocco and how to participate, please contact my co uh, colleague Aziz or anyone here at Plug and Play. Now, we also have a new initiative in Miami, Florida with the MANA Group. We've partnered with MANA because of their commitment to developing Miami's creative community and focus on convening the greater region's rapidly expanding tech ecosystem. Miami is a unique city often recognized for its diversity and central location. We see it as a landing pad with a connecting point between the Americas and many regions around the world. MANA and Plug and Play share the same philosophy that in order for innovation to happen and succeed, people and businesses need to be clustered in a central area. That's why MANA has acquired this critical mass in the downtown area of Flagler District to facilitate this. MANA is attracting international tech and entrepreneurs to the Miami area, but beyond tech, MANA is looking to build a multi-dimensional community that includes vibrant cultural, small business, and higher education elements. They are already supporting art programs and working with universities to bring them into the neighborhood. If you're a startup, a corporate or investor and like to tap into this unique region, I invite you to join us for our kickoff event in mid-January to learn more. And please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. Another recent initiative of Plug and Play has been around the ever evolving online gaming space. We recently partnered with InterDigital, who is a leader in research and development in this sector. Today, we have Donald Butts, Senior, Directory, Senior Director of Strategy, to tell us more. Thank you. We are really excited about this partnership and the new opportunities it will create for us to collaborate with startups in the cloud gaming space. InterDigital is one of the largest pure research, innovation, and licensing companies in the world. The technologies we develop in our labs are standardized and used in devices all around the world, including mobile devices by Apple, Samsung, and Huawei, televisions by Sony, and many others. 
Our global set of labs are working on solving future problems in areas such as lower latency, synthetic content, and quantum computing, to name a few. And we do this through our own internal research efforts, but also in a large extent through in collaborations with partners, universities, and startups. This is why we're so excited about this plug and play partnership. In June of 2019, we acquired Technicolor's video research team and patent assets. As a result, Energy Digital now sits at the intersection of the wireless and visual technologies that will be used in gaming. Our research in light field, point cloud compression, AR, VR, digital doubles, video compression, and other immersive technologies will be key components of any gaming experience. Cloud gaming is an exciting industry use case that leverages in innovations in network architecture, video streaming, and content delivery that will shape the future of interactive gaming and entertainment. Our leadership in the wireless and visual domains is second to none. We have over 5,000 contributions to wireless standards, 25 plus years of experience in video compression technologies, and over 350 researchers worldwide researching these topics. Cloud gaming is one of the core growth areas with a focus on edge computing and synthetic media technologies. Over the past decade, there has been a huge shift in how the world creates and consumes content. And we can see, this, see concrete examples of this change happening. Disney spent $18.7 billion in 2019 on content. Lil Maquila, a digital subway, has over 1.8 million followers. And the countless deepfakes we've all seen in mainstream media. We have entered a new area where machines will be both the tools to help us create new content as well as the creators. As such, this has been a significant area of focus for us. And we've started to partner with others in this space. As an example, we recently partnered with Blacknut, a French startup, to develop new cloud gaming interfaces and low latency edge applications. We are looking forward to more of these collaborations and working with Plug and Play and other industry partners to define this new space. We are interested in startups that focus on new technologies for content creation, automatic pipelines, and scripting that will help us create the tools for endless gameplay and interactive movies. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, for your time and sharing more with us. I know cloud gaming is definitely an interesting space that has seen a great deal of traction in this past year. Speaking of this past year, we've all been faced with many new challenges and I've continued to be impressed with the resiliency of our partners and their commitment to open innovation. We always speak to how quickly a startup needs to pivot to stay alive, but it's quite impressive to see large corporations do the same with their innovation activities. We asked a number of our partners to share how Plug and Play has been able to help with their open innovation strategy and what they're excited for in this upcoming year. So please join me in hearing what they've said. So what we like about working with Plug and Play is the fact that we can connect across different startups across various verticals. And in turn, this helps us expand our network as well. Plug and Play is the best partner who is able to provide so many startups which relate to our focus. I really like that we get access to young, innovative companies that are working on things that we've only just begun to think about. So while we're thinking about it, they're actually doing it. We like to stay close to our customers and understand what they see. The value of open innovation for us really is in seeing what uh, smaller, entrepreneurial-minded companies uh, see in the space. Plug and Play has introduced us to a number of startup companies that are developing a variety of innovative new technologies directed toward a diverse set of end products. We like working with Plug and Play because it really accelerates our, our uh, global innovation agenda. I think one of the main topics they appreciate the most is actually the global reach. Uh, the ability to be always connected to what we have in the latest trends of technology and connected to the latest uh, developments in the startup ecosystem around the globe. The team of Plug and Play brings us a lot of connection points and allocate their resources for our specific needs. So first and foremost, we need people with disruptive ideas. And we are always interested in, in terms of a business development perspective in partnering working with groups who are going beyond, they're going downstream from them. The Plug and Play has introduced us to several interesting setup companies we could not find on our own. 
the quality and maturity and reliability of the companies that are part of the deal flows and ecosystem. As a company that has uh, offices and, and assets all around the world, we needed a company uh, such as Plug and Play who could match that geographical reach and geographical spread. Just within the first couple months of working with the Plug and Play team, we were able to literally uncover uh, 12 to 15 very specific uh, technology and startup organizations uh, that immediately addressed uh, unmet business needs both within our organization as well as for our actual, actual customer base. So open innovation allows us to drive our own internal innovation processes much faster than we've ever been able to do before. We've set the corporate slogan as within the future. It is not only the future for ourselves, but also including the future of customers and societies. So it is very important to involve external ideas to our innovation culture. Open innovation is important to us because we know not all great ideas come from Mon and Hummel. We value the open innovation because it allows us to, um, to see new ideas uh, and to take risk on those new ideas in ways that we might not do it if we didn't have uh, partners in the venture space to, uh, to work with. As a first step, we are conducting global exploratory activities and pursue various collaboration with you, including POC and investment. Everything's changing day by day, and we have to keep up with that in order to survive. Open innovation is very important to us at Kaiser because it allows us to pursue new and external technologies, innovations, business models, and ideas that otherwise not, might not be available to us. Kajima aims to construction as a factory, which is the optimization of construction and create totally new innovative industry. That's why the open innovation is essential. We as a company need to change our conservative and cautious corporate culture by collaborating with young startup companies. We have such a tremendous opportunity to lead in the water and air uh, industries that we serve and innovation, open innovation allows us to increase our pace of investments in these areas. But for us it's very important to be connected to what uh, we see as the latest in terms of new advancements and new technologies and new source of innovation to our business. We believe that a strong way to create the innovative idea is the fusion of startups' ideas and their, our domain expertise. The word open for us points to the ability to tap into these diverse talent base, the innovative community of these regional markets, and really the open-minded, fresh perspectives of businesses that are outside the uh, company so that we can collectively create value together. construction technology, which is the area that I'm focused in, as well as talent solutions and digital manufacturing. Taking the coronavirus challenge and turn it into an opportunity. It's an opportunity to raise a uh, company's awareness about the impacts of air quality. Solving our cu customers' problems and our client issues, whether for the consumer or the business. It's dramatic changes in the electronics business over the next decade, with the introduction of 5G, accelerated adoption of the connected universe, data science, analytics, uh, machine learning, and AI. We're very excited to see where digitalization will impact our industry, as well as continue to pursue efforts in IoT and robotics. Clean energy, circular economy, carbon recycling, as well as in biochemistry. Any technologies that address the built environment, whether it be energy, uh, comfort, assets, we are completely open to learning more about it. A big thank you to our whole ecosystem and everyone participating in today's event. We truly couldn't do it without you. Now, I'd like to highlight one of our particular partners that have stood out in regards to our ecosystem engagement from the very beginning of our partnership. 
engaging in numerous pilots and have shown an exceptional ability to facilitate a successful partnership, even in a 100% virtual capacity. This is why on behalf of the Plug and Play IoT team, we would like to award the Corporate Innovation Award to none other than Oredu. Please help me in giving a warm virtual round of applause to their team while we hear a few words about their success. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Sabah Rabia Al Kawari, and I am Director PR at Uridu Qatar. I am incredibly proud to be here with you today virtually to represent my company and my country. Uridu is Qatar's leading telecommunications operator with a vast customer base and comprehensive range of fixed and mobile services and a reputation for superior network and services. We have enjoyed almost two years of a successful, rewarding partnership with Plug and Play, giving us access to the world's top startup and opportunities to create and integrate new products and services and improve our current portfolio. To date, we can celebrate 10 deal flows of which seven have developed into a pilot or proof of concept. Of the seven pilots, three are in production and among the three in production, one in particular stands out to be highlighted as an example of the phenomenal potential effort by our partnership with Plug and Play. We have been working with Kaban Systems, an intelligent energy storage platform. The objective of Kaban Systems project is to reduce up to 50% of diesel OPEX through clean power solar energy, with increasing uptime through Kaban Systems, software-enabled energy management platform. Via this project with Kaban, we built and launched the first solar panel controlled by machine learning in Qatar. And fittingly, for the times in which we are currently living, the entire engagement between Kaban Systems, Uridu, and our local partner Al Imadi was conducted fully remotely. We are extremely proud of this collaboration with Kaban Systems and of the ongoing partnership with Plug and Play. On behalf of Uridu, I would like to thank you for this award. We believe it reflects our commitment to innovation and it gives us great pride to receive it in recognition of our efforts. Thank you. Absolutely amazing. We've always been impressed with the speed and support Uredo has behind these initiatives. They prove to truly be a role model for us all. Now, right before we get to the startup presentations, a quick reminder that we'll have two hours dedicated to networking and meeting with the presenting startups after the IoT and real estate and construction sessions. If you haven't registered yet, you can do so by scanning this QR code. Once you enter Remo, you'll see this floor plan with each table labeled with one of the presenting startups. I want to call your attention to the left-hand side where you'll notice different floors that you can toggle between. We'll have three floors today, one for IoT, one for real estate and construction, and one for general networking. And as always, we'll have a help desk in the top left, um, top left hand corner for any questions uh, you may have. Now, enough of me. It is my pleasure to introduce not only my colleague and good friend, but also the life of the party and your MC today, Mr. Yanis Shkriveris. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to every single one of you, no matter where you are. What does matter is that you are here with us today. Um, welcome to Plug and Play Winter Summit of 2020. Um, gosh, I truly look like a weatherman over here. Well, if that is the case, then today's forecast is innovative with a chance of a strategic partnership. Ah, hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you for asking. Um, it honestly feels like just yesterday we met at this program's kickoff event, uh, when in reality that was in September, so time truly flies. Uh, it has been a wonderful program with lots of content, heaps of meetings and office hours, um, as well as plenty of introductions over the past several weeks. Uh, today, we are here to see the very conclusion of the program and see what our phenomenal companies participating in it have been up to. 
Um, also, if you share anything on social media uh, about the event or companies attending, uh, please use the hashtag PNP uh, Winter 2020. We would love to see your thoughts and engage with you. Um, as you can see on the screen, my name is Yanis. I will be uh, your MC of the day. Um, and uh, let's have a wonderful session. With that being said, uh, without any further ado, let's hear from the companies themselves. And first up, we'll have Gideon Brothers. We all likely know the Wright Brothers who invented, built, and flew the world's first successful motor-operated airplane. Um, however, Gideon Brothers are keeping it a little bit more grounded and focusing on robotic automation solutions for warehouses. Um, let's hear from them. Mattia, please take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Dario, and I'm from Gideon Brothers. We are a creation-based company with more than 60 engineers in robotics and AI, and we are a provider of mobile material handling automation solutions. We provide both the autonomous capabilities for traditional vehicles, as well as autonomous mobile robots as the one seen in this image. To give you a taste of what we can do, let's take a look at our autonomous technology, or as we like to call it, human-like perception technology. We can differentiate between more than 30 different classes of objects in the environment, giving us the ability to understand the environment in a much better way, and also to have improved navigation capabilities. We can also model the world in 3D, which unlocks new potential use cases. We partner with large end customers, traditional vehicle OEMs, tech component providers, and also industrial robotics automation firms. And to show you what we've been doing lately, uh, here is a sneak peek of our trailer unloading solution. We have combined traditional vehicle with our autonomous technology to tackle one of the toughest problems in distribution centers, and it's the trailer unloading challenge. We have to be able to understand the world in full three dimensions because of all the different pallet placements. And not only that, but we have to be able to work in extremely dynamic environments alongside humans and other machines as well. We have deployed our technology to our autonomous mobile robots as well. And our autonomous mobile robots have been deployed to several different customer environments. This video is showing an example from Leipzig DB Schenker facility, where we have deployed three of our robots supplying packaging material to packaging desks and improving their efficiency. So how do we do it? How do we solve such diverse and tough customer problems across several verticals. Well, because we are a vertically integrated company, we control every major aspect of our autonomy and we design everything from our camera system to the autonomous software. And we have top-notch investors supporting us and our vision. We have raised a total of 7 million through several angel and seed rounds of financing and are preparing series A. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, that with us. Um, also, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for the presenting companies, please do not hesitate to submit them here. Uh, we will have a Q&A panel after uh, several companies have presented, so we can definitely address those questions. Uh, right then. But now let's proceed with our next company of the day, and that is going to be Traction. Uh, devices give us all kinds of signals in the form of sound, vibration, or temperature, for example. This is very important when it comes to manufacturing floors to predict and prevent uh, machine downtime. However, if you guys would be able to also just reassure that I need a new laptop based on the heat this one is giving, as well as the airplane-like sounds I'm hearing, that would be great. Uh, well, we can take that conversation offline, but now let's hear from Team Traction. Please, the stage is all yours. Hi, I'm Igor, I'm the founder of Traction, and our story started in Sign Industries. My father was a maintenance manager and he worked lifetime uh, in an industry as well and had to put out fire uh, and fix machines overnight. Our 
team is divided into data science platform, hardware production, marketing, and sales. We have 12 people in the team today and uh, two investors. One of them is from Stony & Co, which is uh, IPO'd recently, and we already raised uh, 225K. Uh, the problem that we're facing is, is huge. The maintenance routines today is archaic and very inefficient. Industries, as we know, spend lots of money with sudden breaks. And the solutions are very, very expensive. As you can see here, just a tool to measure vibration is over uh, 58K. And the solution that we offer is very simple and affordable platform for maintenance staff to predict failures and breaks of machines, optimize their maintenance routines, and enable data-driven decisions for managers. That all increase uh, uh, the product productivity and also uh, reduce costs. We call it the Band-Aid because it's as easy to glue as a Band-Aid. It's our hardware develop, development and it's plug and play and low friction doesn't go through Wi-Fi. So we don't have to bother IT department. Uh, it goes straight for our mobile carrier and it hits our platform. And our platform, uh, it's like Shazam for industries. We literally listen to our machines. Uh, we know your machines are talking and they're providing insights. And our goal is to detect issues early and, and prevent uh, unplanned downtime. Uh, the insights that we offer are very assertive. They go over WhatsApp uh, directly to the maintenance manager. We're over 70% assertiveness. And here we have one example that we saved in just one afternoon, 25K uh, off in machine. Our competitors, we see that in Brazil, it's very, very much blue ocean. Our market size, we have over 500K SMS industries in Brazil, uh, and they are very unassisted. So our addressable market is $40 billion in a year, and the target that we're focusing on is $2 billion. Uh, the business model, it starts from zero to 50 sensors. You pay 45 per month per sensor, and plus 150 sensors start paying 35 per month. All the platform and connectivity are, is included. Uh, we avoid setup prices, we cover that, and the unit economics, one Band-Aid equals $90 to make, and the hardware payoff, uh, we get it in uh, uh, 65 days with a margin of 75%. Our clients, we have 22 industries uh, and we started our operations a year ago. We have 200 sensors on the street and we expect to reach uh, 400 sensors. And by now we're raising a million dollars uh, for 15% of the company. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing the presentation with us and for being uh, with us here today. Now let's carry on with our next presenter, uh, which is going to be Dapster. They are building a teleoperated pick and place mobile robot for operators of large scale warehouses. Um, let's hear what they have been up to. Please, Team Dapster, take it away today. Hello, I'm Ramesh Sakar. And I'm Scott Thomas, and we're the founders of Dapster AI. Dapster is developing a teleoperated pick and place robot that lives in brownfield warehouses. Here we see a typical warehouse. It's a messy manual operation with pallets on the floor with boxes piled on top. The primary pain point for operators of these large scale warehouses is the reliance on on-site labor. They employ armies of workers to roam the aisles to locate and retrieve requested items. This reliance on labor is expensive. Labor is the number one cost center in the warehouse and recruiting is hard and attrition is off the charts, creating constant churn. And these days, the job is also dangerous, making everything more complicated. The answer to this pain point is clearly automation. The warehouse automation market is well established and growing quickly, but today's picking solutions are all focused on greenfield facilities. They are too disrupted to current operations to deploy into messy brownfield warehouses. They all involve extensive integrations and require the warehouses to make physical changes, re-leveled floors, specific shelving, or a reworked flow of goods. The result is a huge neglected market. Again, 80% of warehouses are brownfield, and there isn't a picking solution today that works in this environment. This is where Dapster shines. We resolve the primary labor pain point, and our solution rolls right into brownfield facilities and demonstrates results immediately. Our solution moves the worker offsite, where they remotely control a fleet of teleoperated mobile pick and place robots. The previously arduous, dangerous job becomes instantly safe, accessible to everyone, and more lucrative. And for companies, the solution delivers immediate and dramatic cost savings and conforms to the existing facility and needs rather than the other way around. 
Dashdel's robot can pick or restock and using a toolkit, perform a variety of tasks to sidestep common edge cases. For example, opening a taped box. The immediate opportunity is to resolve the labor pain point and handle today's picking tasks. The future is in the data. As Dapster's robots move around the warehouse, we unlock valuable data, which will allow us to build a digital twin and develop optimization strategies. Dapster can then execute on those strategies and create a self-optimizing warehouse. We see similar use cases in a variety of industries including the Instacart style shopper at grocery and retail stores and 3PL warehouses and building kits for line side operators in manufacturing facilities. Her recent work is positioned as well to launch Dabster. Between Ramesh and I, we bring picking expertise, customer insights via in-depth case studies, industry experience and relationships and a proven ability to scale to Dabster. We are in our early days. We are seeking an early adopter customer to host a pilot at Dabster and are starting to talk to investors for our first round of funding. We'd love to hear from you with any feedback or questions. Thank you. And we're back. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, now I would like to proceed with our next company. What a joy it is when we can get insights and predictions in real time because we are just so used to having things on demand. Um, Industrial ML keeps uh, manufacturing lines running by delivering critical insights to factory operators in real time. All the way from Cambridge, we have industrial ML team here. Please tell us more about your work. Hi, I'm Hunter Ashmore with Industrial ML, where we make factories smarter with machine learning. This is our first customer, Daiwa Steel, the largest galvanized steel tube producer in Japan. They came to us hoping to increase their production uptime and throughput by understanding what caused errors in their process. To do this, we began by collecting data from existing disparate sources across the factory. We quickly learned that collecting existing digital information was only part of a solution. This is because they rely on visual inspection and manual data recording for quality verification. Inspection is not done until the end of the line where the finished part can be handled by operators. Due to the speed of the production line, they end up inspecting less than 2% of parts, and there is a time lag between when issues begin and when they are flagged. Daiwa has almost 500 alertable quality events a year, and the value of a faster response time alone represents over a million dollars a month in regained revenue. Operators need to know the moment an error occurs to improve factory output. Our solution provides critical data and alerts, giving a real-time view of what is happening on the line. In one place, we provide operators with real-time data visual visualization, streaming machine vision, and alerts with prescriptive information. By applying machine learning, we enable factories to move from reaction to prediction. We do this through our suite of integration tools built on an API-first architecture. Our platform readily connects to existing infrastructure to bring together data and video in one place. Our unique combination of machine learning and predictive algorithms then delivers actionable information preventing unscheduled line stoppages. These solutions are needed in multiple massive markets, including steel, paper, tires, and plastics. We found that the value we can unlock is in the billions of dollars annually. And our target markets are ripe for new solutions. Factory solutions today are akin to ERP systems of the early 90s, fragmented, it's expensive to implement, and lacking middleware to efficiently bridge the gaps. We've built our platform with the flexibility to integrate as many existing sources as possible. We don't need to lock a company into a narrow device ecosystem to enable new insights. Rather than competitors, we see a landscape full of components we can use to draw deeper context from data to unlock new value. To date, we've had a number of wins through our existing networks. We've also found a very lucrative path to the market through channel partners. OEMs like Superior Technologies, the builder of Daiwa's lines, know process manufacturing very well, but they are not software builders. By partnering with them, we offer an upsell to their existing customers, enabling us to scale rapidly in their markets. Our team combines deep expertise of manufacturing, emerging technology, and enterprise software. We are raising a seed round to grow the team and execute on our near-term customer opportunities while continuing productization of our core technology. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for this presentation. I think now we've heard quite a bit today, so we can dive deeper into some questions that uh, you guys want to get off your chest. So please use the 
question box to submit those, but uh, we will have my colleague Addison addressing that and moderating the panel between the companies that have presented and ask some very insightful and intriguing questions. So please, Addison, it's all you. Thanks, Giannis. Appreciate you moderating today. And I think we should be joined by our four startups here, Gideon Brothers, Traction, Dapster, and Industrial ML. So I'll give them a moment to jump back on if they can start their screens for some questions. Perfect. I see we have a few people popping up, so I don't want to waste any of your time um, with introductions since we just saw you. Let's get straight into some of these questions. So I think it's probably obvious to all of us that we're coming to this from a virtual place this year. We're at a, here at a virtual summit due to the state of the world. So I'm curious for you guys during this pandemic, what have been some of the biggest hurdles you faced as a company? And are there any key takeaways from this time period you could pass on to some of the other startups we have here today? Anyone okay, <laughs> who should go first? All right. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's a very good question. So Gideon Brothers, a robotics company building autonomous mobile robots. So uh, what we figured out was extremely challenging or it was challenging to even think about it to actually commission autonomous mobile robots to put them in operation uh, inside warehouse manufacturing sites. Uh, so um, inside some uh, uh, environments where before having such flexible systems, we, we used to have or uh, uh, companies used to need uh, many people on site, many engineering uh, hours uh, being spent on site to actually commission the robots. And um, we actually delivered uh, uh, the vehicles through this uh, pandemic mess uh, full remotely, managed to deploy them without having single engineer on site by only utilizing manpower uh, 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 of the end user, uh, which was a, a really significant, significant uh, like game-changing moment for them. Because typically how it uh, operate uh, is that we have vehicle OEM, so robotics manufacturer, then there were integrators who were helping the end users use the technology. And now they figured out that by using uh, the technology stack, the flexible system that we uh, uh, sold them, they figured out they can uh, deploy it completely on their own without having third party company integrator in the loop and even without having our engineering team on site. So in brief. Oh, that's awesome. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if that resonated with any of the rest of you, if you have other ideas. So it actually helped us uh, at Dapster because we're a tele-operated robot. So by, by the very definition, uh, you're going to be remote and you're going to be remotely operating our robots, right? So um, I hate to say this, but it was actually uh, a good thing for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think that the for us, the urgency of um, remote factory monitoring and understanding operations, like it's always been a a, you know, top five type of priority for factories that we've talked to of like who doesn't want to improve operations, but um, the urgency of digitizing for some of these legacy factories uh, it became a top two priority. Um, one of the things we did find was um, while the urgency had increased, there are a lot of factories who are eager to engage, but at the same time, resources are limited because they're busy firefighting, figuring out how to respond. So for us, a lot of the strategy we've been focused on was around um, how do we do the, the, the minimum engagement to create or to demonstrate the value proposition and customer value, particularly without extensive integration? Um, so this this was one of the things that we had to spend a lot of time thinking about. And I, I mean, you're all, I think when you're a startup, you're always trying to think about the fastest path to value, but um, what you can integrate and what resources you can assume are available, even that had to shift a little bit more over the summer. Um. No, that makes total sense. And I think I'm, it's interesting that I'm hearing you talk about factories because that's one thing you all have in common is you implement in facilities in some way or another. I'm curious, maybe shifting from the present to a little bit of the future, what do you see as kind of this smart factory of the future and how do you see yourself fitting in there? I, I can go on so, that one. Oh, no, go ahead, <laughs> by all means. Yeah, no, not sure if we keep the same word. So, uh, okay, uh, so Gideon Brothers is, delivers a, a human powered visual perception capability. So the, the history was 
a lot about predetermined paths, uh, uh, infrastructure that was guiding robots like magnetic tapes, reflectors, and stuff like that. So what we believe is the future are way more capable systems that actually per uh, perceive environment very similar to how we humans do it. Um, and we believe it's going to be even more important uh, in the future because uh, we, we expect flexibility from all those processes in, in manufacturing sites. We expect that manufacturing environment can change within a couple of weeks from, uh, uh, from one building one product to building another, uh, even if we talk about extremely large facilities. And so what we need are really vehicles that can adapt to this environment, very similar to how we humans adapt to it if we drive some manual vehicles. And so that's why we believe 3D and AI powered vehicles are the future. I mean, this was not possible a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, like hardware was not there. We didn't have computational capacities that we have from our computers. Uh, we didn't have software uh, uh, engines, frameworks that we have today, uh, like all those, all this infrastructure that we have to, to use artificial intelligence components, neural networks. This was just not there before. And at this point in time, we just have all the building blocks which are critical to deliver a completely new generation of autonomy technology to those manufacturing sites and warehouse environments. Yeah, so the, you know, from my perspective, I think um, uh, the person from Gideon Brothers said it best, right? The future factory is expected to be nimble and flexible and dynamically adapt to you know, changes in the supply chain and supply and demand. Right? And so the only way forward is to have real-time access to demand and supply data to react really quickly, right? So Dapster is, the reason we built Dapster is to exactly address that. Sudden changes in labor, sudden changes in environment, right? Uh, a teleoperated robot like Dapster can perform fulfillment, can perform restocking, can be doing things like, you know, assembly, uh, you know, cutting open cardboard boxes with tools, all of those different types of things. That's one of the motivating factors behind Absure as well. Yeah, I mean, I again, building on that, I completely agree. Um, what we saw, I mean, there's there's a grander play of making the entire supply chain smart and 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 Dapster and is obviously, I mean, you guys are solving a part of this as well. Um, what we found was that the data inside the factory needs to exist before you can go beyond the factory. Um, and I think that towards the future, we're seeing a lot of um, there's been promise of edge devices for a while and digitization of the physical world transformation, but that's really, there were a lot of inflexibilities in those capabilities. I mean, so for example, there was a question in the chat about like legacy devices and the ability to put an edge device, whether it's a, a, a industrial grade Raspberry Pi um, device or a new NVIDIA device to do ETL, like transform the data, collect data from older devices or newer devices supply that either locally to a server or to the cloud. I mean, all of these capabilities, the devices have gotten so much smarter and so much more capable that what you can now collect um, is really expanding. I mean, that doesn't even get to uh, vision as a sensor and the direction that's going, the idea of real-time machine vision combined with real-time data. I mean, that's those are new areas of research that um, autonomous vehicles have been pushing that edge, but it's just now making its way into the factory um, from a cost and value standpoint. Thanks. And I think you guys very kind of cogently described what this future could look like. Um, one thing I'm curious, maybe connecting where we are now to then, is there anything about this new world we've entered in your own um, internal processes, things like virtual teams, virtual selling that you think you'll continue through to that future? Or will it stay in this COVID-19 world and you'll go back to your old processes once it's over? Maybe one thing interesting, interesting to share about that is that uh, in our case, we haven't done a single uh, selling that was like on site and it's been almost a year right now. So we changed the whole thing. Uh, we had this proposal, but we weren't even sure if it would stick through because we know that maintenance managers, especially, they like to go show you the factory, drink a coffee and uh, put all the protection and so on. Uh, but for us, we just... Uh, we were already born with that mentality that we would ship the sensors and do all the onboarding online. And I think this will stick because it actually saves a lot of time and it goes straight to the value that you're offering. 
there's no such thing as come here and uh, more like in the consulting stage where you see, oh, this is this and here are a couple of things. Like generally the inquiries that we have right now, it's straight to a specific like pain that they're having. They know exactly what they want to solve and there's less time for uh, this consulting and more time to go straight to the value proposition. So I think that's great and I hope this will stick around. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, uh, the time for cutting a deal, the time span for cutting a deal is substantially smaller now, right? People are much more efficient in conveying uh, what they, you know, what their value proposition. Customers are much more efficient in giving us their pain points and we're able to make the rounds with a lot more customers a lot faster, right? So things have sped up substantially because of this. And I, and I, and I don't see a world where we slow down substantially from here. Right, it's uh, because we've all gotten hooked onto this, right? Imagine I can speak to like 10 customers in a day. That is unheard of uh, in the past, so. Yeah, I completely agree with that. The, the idea of a virtual first meeting versus we need to fly to a customer site and visit them first before we can even start like thinking about, uh, about engagements. Like the, the, the adoption of the, of the, the virtual first um, engagement I think is, has really changed the cycle. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree with the guys. Really, no many things to add. I just say it's it's now more about DIY approach very often on the end user side. Those guys are also uh, uh, living more and more out of their comfort zone. Uh, so not expecting from uh, someone else solving all of their problems, but really uh, uh, seeking for information. Having what we also give as insight from other from customers is that they're talking to many people uh, in short period of time, uh, just as uh, Hunter mentioned before. So this uh, possibility to, to talk with many people within a day also holds on the other side, so on the customer side. So we can even much faster learn from customer, which we find extremely useful in this uh, product development process. Awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate you all of your time today. Unfortunately, that is about all the time we have for this Q&A session, um, but I appreciate your presentations. We all, I think, learned a lot from this discussion. So thanks for joining us. And I will, with that, pass it back to Giannis to continue on with the startup presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Edison. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Well, thank you, Addison. That was super cool. Um, I think now we can carry on with the rest of the event, shall we? Um, next up, we will have Edgeless Systems that develops a data processing platform that solves the problem when it comes to trust. The foundation of the platform is a highly secure and scalable SQL database that runs on trusted execution environments. Let's hear from the team itself. Uh, please, the stage is all yours. Hi, my name is Felix Schuster. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Edge Systems, a German deep tech security startup. Let's dive right in. Here's our elevator pitch. Increasingly, we see that companies cannot use all their data because of regulation and security and privacy concerns. To address this, we built the most secure platform to store, analyze, and share data using confidential computer. Let me give you an example. We are currently working on an exciting project with Bosch. As you may know, Bosch runs one of the world's largest car repair shop chains. Each shop collects lots of valuable data, and Bosch wishes to pool and analyze that data for different benefits. However, most of the data is subject to privacy regulation like GDPR, and antitrust regulation also comes into play. As a result, Bosch is currently not using the data at all. We are changing this. So here's our solution, the Edgeless platform. You can think of the platform as a scalable and super secure black box that stores and processes data in a verifiable way. The first step is always to initialize the platform with what we call a data manifest. The manifest defines how data is handled by the platform and who gets access to the outputs. Next, we connect the sensitive data sources. For example, the car repair shops. And we give the final analysis results in a privacy-preserving way to the analysts. The 
key features that we have are true end-to-end -end encryption, end-to-end -end verifiability. Everything is easy to set up, scale, and integrate the existing IT landscapes. We achieve all this through the combination of cryptography, innovative software engineering, and computational computing hardware such as Intel SGX. Computational computing allows for the isolated and verifiable execution on untrusted computers, for example, in the cloud. We have a great team of engineers who are experts in all these fields. I was, for example, one of the first to work with computational computing when I joined Microsoft after my PhD. To give you an idea of what's possible, here are a few of the exciting use cases we are working with our partners in different verticals. In manufacturing, we enable the secure pooling of industrial IoT data to improve predictive maintenance. In mobility, we enable the responsible and secure training of AI on large amounts of data from connected cars. In finance, we enable the privacy-preserving detection of money laundering and fraud. We believe that there are many more exciting use cases and we are eager to learn about your use cases. Finally, we are also raising the seed round. Thanks. Awesome. Well, that was Edgeless Systems, but now we can carry on with the next company. Um, sometimes AI systems can be very energy and computing power demanding. Well, that is no longer a big deal because our next company optimizes your AI to significantly uh, reduce the energy consumption and execute up to 16 times faster than before. I'm in no position to speak about this in much detail, but we have team from EmbedDL uh here to shed more light on this please guys take it away hi let me start with a question how do you ensure that you get the most out of your ai solutions my name is henrik and i will give you a solution to that question but first let me introduce embeddle we at embeddle are experts at optimizing deep learning models Deep learning is currently the most used technique for creating advanced AI systems. We have a long list of partners and customers, and we are a member of several networks. Our optimization engine has received several awards for its unique technology. So why should you care about deep learning model optimization? Firstly, for maximum performance, Deep learning is computationally expensive and you want to ensure all your computational power is used as efficiently as possible. Secondly, to save money, deep learning requires powerful hardware, which tends to be expensive. Optimizing your models opens up for possibilities to save on hardware. How much can we increase the performance? Let's have a look at this benchmark we did recently. A number our models have been executed on a variety of hardware. And we can see here that Embeddel improves the execution time up to 11 times and 4.3 times on average. How much money do we save? Let's have a look at this example of a car manufacturer. Their LiDAR requires a $299 chipset. After Embeddel optimization, they can use a $129 chipset saving $170, which leads to an annual saving of $17 million. Hopefully by now, I've convinced you that you should do optimization of your deep learning models. But why should you choose Embeddel? First of all, we are optimization specialists. And our close collaboration to the academia ensures that the latest algorithms are constantly applied, keeping you up to date. Secondly, focus. Optimization requires time consuming experimentation. Let us do the optimization so you can focus on developing your core product, doing what you are best at. To sum, to sum it up, our award winning deep learning optimization engine improves performance, reduces hardware costs, ensures that the latest optimization technology is being used, lets you focus on the core problem, and ensures that you get the most out of your AI solutions. Thank you. 
And we're back again. Thank you so much for this wonderful, insightful presentation. Um, let's move on. Oh, how often I encounter times when I just wish my computer would understand me and what I want. The next company, Smabler, makes machines understand humans, but in a little bit different way. Uh, the language engine that they have developed analyzes and unlocks uh, knowledge from diverse textual data uh, for your business needs. Um, let's hear from Aga and Luke about how they tackle the NLP space. Please, it's all you guys. Hello everyone, my name is Aga and I'm CTO at Smabler. Many companies from manufacturing areas, like for example our client Schneider Electric, spend millions a year for costs related to product quality, warranties and replacement. At the same time, these companies have unstructured text data like incoming customer communication, which contains knowledge critical for product quality, risk assessment or weak signal detection. Fortunately, these companies understand this data potential, but unfortunately, there are multiple challenges like data diversity and no easy way to uncover knowledge hidden in this data. Smatter is a language graph technology that structures unstructured text data and provides automation and analytics ready organized knowledge. With that, we can use insight we generate at scale and help companies save up to 20% of quality costs, shortening time to fault detection by six months. When we think about typical process flow, at the beginning, we have this incoming data, which is stored in different repositories like CRM. And at the end of the process, we have different end user and front-end application that need organize and interpret data to perform. Smother is a horizontal middleware and add-on layer on text data repositories. It sits on top of data intensive processes, ingests data, interprets it, and provides precisely organized data superset. Our solution in base is based on proprietary technology. There are three key components. The first component is a cause effect language engine that provides over 90% of accuracy. It's domain process and language agnostic and does the not require training and manual data pre-processing. The second component is a knowledge graph that allows us to precise working with context and meaning. And the third component is an input-output virtualization tool that allows us to implement the solution in a few days. We can use this technology to provide holistic view of company's data asset for process like risk assessment, predictive maintenance, or customer knowledge management, among others. And a few words about the company. So uh, we spent a few years to build the technology. We were self-funded. Now we generate revenue and we are during our first fundraising round. Thank you very much for your time. If you will have any questions, just let's talk. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think we can move forward and hear from our next company. I also think it's no secret that data is extremely important to build any AI model. Um, sometimes it's not easy to gather the necessary visual data if you are attempting to create a computer vision model, for example. and uh, that's where synthetic data comes into play. Uh, Synthesis AI has a simple API that enables the programmatic generation of millions of images with an expanded set of pixel perfect labels to help you build new and better models. Um, Yashar, please tell us more about how that works. I think everyone is eager to hear about that. Please, it's all you now. Hello, my name is Yashar Bazadeh. I'm the CEO of Synthesis AI. We are pioneering synthetic data technologies to build more capable AI. It is estimated by the year 2022 there will be 45 billion connected cameras in the world, all powered by computer vision AI systems. These include our personal devices, devices in our homes, uh, the growing world of autonomous vehicles, and industrial robotics as well. All of these systems uh, leverage supervised learning uh, fundamentally to train the AI systems. This requires collecting lots of raw data, having humans annotate the features of interest, and then training uh, modern deep learning systems. 
there's this current paradigm is fundamentally limiting. It's incredibly expensive and time consuming to acquire the data. Uh, it comes with a number of privacy and compliance issues, especially with data relating to humans. Uh, it can be biased based on how you acquire data and where you acquire the time you acquire it. Um, and then probably the most interesting uh, kind of limitation is that humans can't label key features that are required to build emerging new applications. We are pioneering synthetic data. We believe this is the 100x solution for computer vision by bringing together traditional visual effects and CGI pipelines together with generative uh, AI models, things like GANs, we're able to create uh, highly diverse, large amounts of data with uh, pixel perfect annotation. This allows for on-demand data uh, generation via a very simple API interface. It's orders of magnitude more cost and time effi uh, efficient. It's, there's no privacy issues and uh, it enables an expanded set of pixel perfect labels because when you're generating the images, you know every single attribute about every single pixel. Our product is very simple uh, with a lot of complexity underneath. Uh, the, the simplicity comes in the interface. For ML engineers who are interested in creating data, there's a simple API that allows, allows them to simply govern the distribution of the data and the various attributes that they're interested in. Underneath the hood, we have uh, proprietary assets being put together and uh, various procedural generation pipelines to create on demand, just mountains of data that's pixel perfect uh, labeled with a great degree of variation and, and diversity. To give you a sense of kind of the projects we've done in the past and, and some of the uh, applications of synthetic data, I'm gonna show a couple of case studies. This first case study is for a global handset manufacturer. In fact, we're working with three of the top four uh, global handset manufacturers. We're creating thousands of unique IDs, millions of images across multiple imaging modalities to empower uh, the next generation of face ID and verification systems. Since this AI, we're ushering in a new paradigm for computer vision. We think it's going to be a, a very incredibly powerful uh, set of technologies that are transform how these systems are built, leading to 100x improvement. We're a leading partner for global technology and Fortune 500 companies. You can reach out to me at Yashar at Census AI for any business and investment inquiries. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks, Yashar, for the presentation and thanks for being with us here today at the summit. Um, now, next up, we will have Ionix. Please raise your hand if you wish your battery lasted longer, no matter if it's your phone or laptop or electric vehicle. Yes, I'm all about that. Um, I'm team bad battery as well. Uh, however, the future is bright because the battery lasts longer. Um, Ionix is using a combination of proprietary machine learning libraries and data sets on millions of materials. That way, enabling rapid optimization of every component in the battery cells. Um, Team Ionix, the stage is yours, please. This is uh, super exciting what you're working on. Hello, this is Austin Sendak, founder and CEO here at AIonix. And our mission at AIonix is to enable the discovery and adoption of new technologies for decarbonizing transportation, the electricity grid and heavy industry. And we do that by supporting rapid innovation in batteries and other energy-based materials by helping organizations to leverage the hidden power of R&D data. And the what of what we do is we do this by providing consulting services and software products for AI-based materials discovery, system level design, and process optimization. In other words, I like to call what we're doing uh, building a Siri for science, meaning if I'm a chemist and I like chemistry A, chemistry B is okay and I don't like chemistry C, can I feed that data into a smart lab assistant who will analyze it for patterns based on my behaviors or based on my results and provide a path forward much in the same way that Spotify or Netflix might do this for music or for movies? And that's essentially what AIonics is. We work across a really broad range of R&D problems. Our, our approach is quite flexible, but ultimately I want to draw your attention to those bold words on the right hand side of the slide, which quantify the improvement factor we've been able to provide to our clients to date two, three, 10x improvement in the speed and productivity of their research. And because this is so significant, we believe that building a comprehensive data strategy is becoming essential for manufacturers and OEMs in this space. And it's not easy because most of the new work, the approaches and the talent are either siloed in universities or they're siloed in forward-thinking corporations who have the resources to attract that talent. And as we all know, the amount of data and computational power is increasing exponentially. And so this is meaning that early adopters are really getting a significant advantage while late adopters are being quickly left behind. And so our goal is to democratize uh, access to these approaches. 
Our executive team is myself. I'm a Stanford PhD in applied physics, and I've been working on machine learning for battery design for the past seven years or so. Our chief scientist, Venkat Viswanathan, is a Stanford PhD in chemical engineering, now professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And our CTO, Linson Pelishow, is a Stanford PhD in material science, and prior to Aionics, was leading projects in this field uh, at Slack National Laboratory. We also have a scientific advisory board um, composed of some of the best names in the field, notably um, Professors Shibweze Amanchukwu and Will Chu. And we've worked with several companies. Uh, the three that we can mention publicly are Showa Denko, Form Energy, and Qberg. And at the current stage, uh, we are not fundraising per se. We're actually looking more for new partnerships and new projects so we can identify uh, new use cases and build new customer testimonials um, so that we can build some more, mom more momentum for our company, uh, expand our products, and then bring that momentum into our next fundraising event, which is likely to be uh, at some point in 2021. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to speaking with you. As I said, I think the future is very bright. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I think now, again, we can take a Q&A break and um, again, ask anything that's on your mind because we have these wonderful companies here today. So this is your opportunity to get all of those questions out. Um, for this piece, again, I would like to invite my colleague Addison to moderate that. Addison, it's all you now. Thanks, Giannis. Appreciate that and appreciate these startups for taking the time to introduce us all to their technology. I think we should have these five founders on the line with us today, so hopefully they can answer some exciting questions. Let me give them all a moment to jump on. Perfect. Well, it looks like we kind of have critical mass and I definitely want to get us started on questions so we can hear a lot from you guys in the limited time we have. I think one thing that's um, obvious about this group we have assembled is that you all are going to be working with these large corporations, um, ones like we have in the audience here today. So I'm curious, what are sort of the inherent risks you found in working with these large corporations and how have you worked to address them with your startup and your business practices? Okay, so maybe my, my answer. Uh, so the I think that uh, the one important thing, uh, if you know, consider this worst uh, case scenario when uh, cooperating uh, when there is cooperation between startups and you know these big companies. Uh, so this is the uh, about agility, about you know being able to uh, to provide a solution uh, that uh, you know doesn't interrupt, uh, doesn't dis you know doesn't interrupt with uh, with enterprise systems. So uh, so this is the first thing, uh, and I think you know the and. Uh, a giant approach to cooperation process. So I think it's. Nice, awesome. Anyone else have immediate thoughts? No worries. If not, we can kind of move forward. Maybe we can move forward a similar question, but on a more positive note. Is there any way you've noticed working with corporations, you have a major advantage or something you found that's like a great advantage, a great best practice that you can share with the other startups when working with some of these larger corporations? So maybe I'll chime in here. Why not? Uh, yeah, so I, I find that it's one of the key things to making sure it a large enterprise uh, kind of deal partnership uh, works out is that you identify the, the proper stakeholder uh, within within the organization. Oftentimes, you have many people you're talking to, either they're technical or business heads. Uh, but, you know, so navigating that at the at the front end is is very helpful. And if you I do have that internal champion, that that definitely helps drive any kind of business uh, development or a partnership through. Yeah, and I would just add that um, you know working with big companies uh, just compounds your ability to have an impact. Um, I think that that makes that really exciting and really fun. Um, I think the one thing that we try to keep in mind is that we are a small company with limited resources, and we're when we're working with you know billion dollar companies. Uh, you kind of have to keep in mind of, of you know the, the the scale of those resources. And so for us as a startup, there we don't have those sorts of resources, but we have a lot of flexibility. We have a lot of risk tolerance, and uh, I think there's a lot of you know there's there are a lot of things a startup can bring um, that are that are really unique. And I think those are the things that are worth worth focusing on rather than trying to you know outspend uh, you know a, a Fortune 50 company or something like that. So really focusing on the value add, I think, is critical. Awesome. 
Awesome. And I think you have a good point there, Austin, about startup teams often being super lean. I'm curious now, you know, the other elephant in the room is that we're doing this virtually. This is in a work from home situation. How have you managed a team, a lean team specifically moving to this work from home world? Um, and there is there anything you're going to carry through into the future that you've learned from this process? I'd be happy to chime in on that one again. Um, so we are, uh, we actually were, were fully remote pre COVID. Um, I think we were maybe one of the few companies that were, were doing that. And so it hasn't been, fortunately, I guess, hasn't been too disruptive. Um, I, I think it's, it's really the way of the future. Um, so we have uh, seven employees across four continents um, currently, and the time difference is always a challenge, but um, I think, you know, ultimately uh, giving people the freedom to live where they want to live uh, and and still, you know, have the opportunities in the work they want to do is, is really valuable. So um, I think, you know, daily standups and regular check-ins and kind of making sure that you're all online at the same time is super important to making sure you don't lose productivity. Um, but I think it's it sort of behooves all of us to start thinking about this um, because I think a lot of this is probably going to stay post-COVID. But I'm curious to hear what the other panelists have found. So yeah, so I completely echo echo Austin. We were fully remote as well, uh, heading into into COVID, um, and being able to uh, hire the right people anywhere in the world is a is a strategic advantage. You know, there's incredibly gifted, and talented people everywhere, um, and being able to bring them into the to your network and to your uh, your company uh, will ultimately make sure you're uh, scaling in a very cost effective and and uh, way. So. I don't think I won't be original if I say the same thing that we were already <laughs> remote uh, pre-COVID. So actually, we didn't notice it. It's it was actually there was no problem with that with adjustment. But what we also mentioned, I think earlier, that this is also connected with uh, being able, you know, work working remotely and being able to address um, the challenges of our clients also remotely. This this greatly enhances the the, the agility that we can react to anything. So. Uh, we don't have to have you know boots on the ground physically sit there for four months to actually implement anything. So I'm now trying to connect to the question that's on the chat: How long did it take to make a corporate match with the startups? Uh, I, I think I'm understanding this question as as how quickly can a, a company, a, a, a potential client, see some kind of uh, see the match and the, the added value of actually cooperating with a startup. So I think for, for any startup is to, it's important to actually quickly um, after engagement show, show the proof of value that the, that the solution or the, the type of um, uh, products or service that they are providing are able to enhance the daily life of the, of the corporate. So, so it should not be months, should be weeks, days uh, maximum to have this uh, quick proof of value and then have the decision to continue. Awesome. Well, I think all of you talking about being remote pre-COVID um, reminds me that, you know, one thing you all have in common is you're working in this world of big data and artificial intelligence. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about that, especially since you've all been in this world for a little while. Maybe can you give some insights on how artificial intelligence development has changed over the past few years, especially some of these new tools like DevOps process becoming easier and more streamlined. Has you seen anything change over your experience? Well, I'll, I'll chime in because I think maybe our, our change is a little more fundamental. So we, we don't reuse real data. We use synthetically generated data. So that's a significant change uh, in how workflows and, and kind of uh, integrations work. And especially in the computer vision domain, with specific clients that we use, we're getting to the point of the fidelity of these tools enabling essentially really high uh, resolution um, uh, simulation of real world environments. And that allows you to just build things in such a different way. Um, I think with things like COVID have accelerated uh, this, this thinking since you can't be out in the real world collecting data, you really have to think of a, a new different way of, of doing this. So that, that is a fundamental change in our business. So I think in our world of uh, kind of material science and, and physics and chemistry, um, when I started my PhD work in the seven years ago, I think it was very much an open question as to whether or not this kind of thing would actually work. Um, and there's now been, I think, a number of successes. Um, even a few years ago, I think maybe there was still some, could still be some questions about, you know, can machine learning really help a chemist in the lab? 
I think um, definitively over the last few years, we've seen uh, that the answer is yes. Um, and I'm happy to work with our chief scientist, Venkat um, Viswanathan at CMU, who has been really a pioneer in this in this field, and I think has proven that this, this stuff can uh, provide value. And so I think for us over the last few years, it's really become pretty clear that um, machine learning can have an impact in, in this domain, uh, whereas maybe a few years ago it wasn't. At the same time, you're also seeing the, the proliferation of uh, machine learning codes, things like scikit-learn and TensorFlow, and uh, that makes all of this stuff a lot more accessible and, and makes machine learning fluency a lot higher. Um, so it's, it's really starting to have a pretty big impact in our, in our industry. Yeah, what we are seeing is that there are increasingly new technologies that allow you to securely and verifiably collect data for your AI training. So there's, of course, competition computing, which I mentioned the, in our pitch, but there's also federated learning, for example, or there's FHE, things like that, that make the collection of large, large amounts of data easier and, and, and more secure. And I think there will be interesting development, the, the developments coming out of that in the future. Awesome, and I think, um... You know, you mentioned Austin working with CMU and we actually had a question come in from the audience and when you're working with these big institutions and especially big educational institutions, how do you kind of bring them in to support your projects? What's your strategy of working with them? Yeah, I, I think for us, um, having those educational or academic connections is, is super important because we are oftentimes kind of designing, uh, you know, working on really fundamental research questions and designing new you know, research processes. So we, uh, we have a, an advisory board of, I believe, six professors from various universities uh, working in this field. Um, and they're kind of just, you know, our, our bench, right, that we can go to and say, hey, you know, we're working with a client that has this question, what papers should we look at or what, what models should we consider? And um, that's, that's really helpful because our team can only stay abreast of so much. And so we have basically, you know, a, a, a shadow team that's kind of helping us to, um, to stay aware of this research. And so... Uh, I think in, on questions where there's some element of, of research involved or something that's, you know, you got to be on top of kind of what's coming out of the universities. I think those partnerships um, can be, it can be really valuable. Awesome. And we actually had another great question come in from the audience. I'd love some of y'all's thoughts on this. Um, they're asking about open source code and information on the public domain, and maybe how do you maintain a proper balance between your own proprietary algorithms versus the external sources? And how do you take advantage of those external sources? So maybe uh, I try to answer from our perspective. So uh, we don't really care about this balance because uh, the truth is uh, we do not use external open source algorithms. So we build our technology, uh, you know, at our side. So uh, the all the whole technology is fully proprietary. So uh, I, I think that's why uh, that's uh, how we can handle this uh, this problem. Awesome. Anyone else have thoughts on open source and how they use it in their business? I, I would just add, I think open source is, uh, you know, you can't compete with free stuff, basically. Um, and open source is great for a lot of things. I mean, um, you know, it, at least in our field, open source software can save a lot of time, but there are certain things open source can't do. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not maintained. It's not, you know, on an active uh, cloud instance, like there, there's no customer service. And so we do incorporate a fair amount of open source um, code and, and packages. Um, but we think that there's still a, a kind of essential service element that needs to sort of be wrapped around, uh, around those things. And so we try to take advantage of that when we can, but um, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to do everything. So there's still a, there's still a business model in there somewhere. Makes total sense, makes total sense. Um, well, I wanna say thank you to you guys for participating today. Unfortunately, that's about all the time we have time for, all the questions we have time for, um, but I appreciate you all chiming in um, and we will pass it back to Giannis to continue with the rest of the presentation. Thank you all for that. It's me again, I'm back. Um, let's move on into the next section of the event and um, after nine months of the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of your organizations may have partially returned back to the office. 
Allward has enabled some of the largest manufacturers with return to work programs at their factories and warehouses, thanks to their solutions for workplace safety and security. Let's hear more about how that works and how they do that uh, from themselves. Team Allward, please take it away. My name is Mohit Kurt and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Allward, an AI platform for integrated safety and security at the workplace. Oloid is a pre-Series A stage startup with investment from marquee investors such as Emergent Ventures, Unusual Ventures, and Plug and Play Ventures. We are working with some of the top industrial brands with over 100,000 workers using the platform on a daily basis. The existing tech for physical authentication is old school. It requires contact, is hard to use, and provides poor security. If I have somebody's badge, I essentially have their identity. Moreover, the existing solutions do not integrate into the identity management framework of the company. The current single sign-on solutions were not designed for physical applications such as doors, turnstiles, and time locks. A modern framework for identity management and access control has been more important in light of the new normal of the pandemic. Physical infrastructure needs to be contactless, needs to be integrated into the cybersecurity architecture, and fully in sync with the health and safety procedures of an organization. Oloid provides a fully integrated workspace management solution wherein multiple factors of contactless authentication are combined with safety rules to automate physical security and safety processes. Oloid integrates with existing backend system, HR and payroll systems, and more than 90% of physical access control systems. Let's look at some examples of customer deployments and benefits. Fortune 500 manufacturer Flex is leveraging Oloid across its factories and warehouses for contactless clocking and access control. As opposed to requiring hourly workers to first go for safety screening and then come to time clocks, all of its integrations with time and attendance systems such as Kronos and ADP allow safety screening to be integrated into the day of the life of a worker. With all of integrations across access control systems, the safety screening can also be used to gate turnstile or door access. This also integrates with FLIR's thermal camera SDK, which allows our customers to provide QR code based health attestations and thermal scanning on the same device, thereby increasing efficiency, safety, and security. Oloid also provides valuable analytics such as occupancy metrics and SMS email alerts if a safety rule is at risk and automatically prevents unauthorized access or at risk entry. Oloid has a very strong ROI and while it's hard to estimate the high cost that could result from bad PR or lawsuits from outbreak of viruses at the workplace, the reduction in physical security risk and buddy swiping and time clocks itself pays for itself for the Oloid solution. Here are some examples of your customers who attest to the value created by Oloid. We are looking forward to an opportunity to work with your teams to implement a POC that can demonstrate how Oloid can streamline safety and security at your work sites and reduce significant costs. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Team Oloid. This is super relevant for the current day. And I think while we're on the same topic of uh, safe returning to the office, our next presenter, Clarify, improves employee well-being and productivity by optimizing indoor air quality to users' needs and activity with smart sensors and software. To tell you more about their solution, we have them here today. So please, the virtual stage is all yours. Tell us more about what Clarify is all about. I'm Felix, CEO of Clarify. Thank you for being here today. We spend 90% of our time indoors, and most buildings do not adapt to the needs of their users. As a result, well-being and productivity decrease because there is a lack of thermal comfort and ventilation is not pollution dependent. Our solution starts with measuring and providing the analytics to make strategic decisions to optimize and control building management systems, empower employees with an app, and prioritize interventions with detailed reporting. That's why we designed a high-end human-centric climate sensor. It provides detailed insight into the most important factors that affect the building users. Clients prefer a service because we measure aerosols, provide high data frequency to improve ventilation real time, help to improve thermal comfort, engage employees, provide flexible connectivity, and detailed reporting. This is also what they say. Our offer is a low entry quick scan and a sensor as a service with a fixed price per sensor per year, flexible software modules, and integration add-ons. Real estate faces a paradigm shift. 
The sector must invest in healthy offices to boost office attractiveness and to generate post-pandemic returns. Because of the coronavirus, people are aware of the importance of indoor air quality. Innovators and early adopters seize the opportunity to boost asset value and company attractiveness by showcasing themselves already with certifications. During the PNP program, we were able to apply new insights to the extent of our deal flow. We attracted new customers such as ING as well as one of the largest sports brands in the world. That's why we expect strong positive growth for the future. Our team is characterized by a passion for entrepreneurship, transparency, and the absolute drive to make sustainable impact. My co-founders Tibor and Wim both have a background in business and IT. Tibor also on healthcare, while Wim was an innovation fellow at Stanford and set up other businesses previously. I have a background in environmental science and went to Bocconi University for finance and accounting. Our advisory board consists of skilled advisors. Jin has an MBA from UCLA, C-level experience, and mentor startups. Jan Rijk is a VP at KPN Networks, the largest telecom in the Netherlands. He's a thought leader on IoT and 5G, and Hein worked for years as a management and innovation consultant at Accenture. He helps organizations define, meet, and exceed their sustainability goals. We see exciting opportunities in both real estate and IoT with our international partners to exchange knowledge and grow faster. They are experts in the field of AI building intelligence, sustainability consulting, and indoor climate optimization. We want to do more corporate pilots in the future, together with some of the amazing companies that are present here today. Let's plant the seeds today after the pitches and grow fruitful business together. Thank you so much and thank you Plug and Play for providing the opportunity to be here today and the whole program. Perfect, well, now that is all clear, thanks clarify, clarify, I'm sorry. Um, our next presenter brings tactile intelligence to robots for industrial and surgical environments to know exactly how to handle the object and execute the process. Now we will hear from Robert about their technology. Please, with a warm round of applause, let's welcome Force N. Hello everyone, I'm Robert Brooks. I'm the founder and CEO of Force N, where we make a patented paper thin for sensing technology for high reliability applications in industrial IoT and robotics, medical, aerospace, automotive, and beyond. And this technology is unique from any other sensor on the market for its combination of accuracy, paper thin flexible profile, like you can see on the screen here, and industrial robustness. And this enables you to embed force sensing into applications in your industrial process where you never could before, including lightweight, high speed equipment, compact spaces, harsh environments and even existing or custom equipment. And the film gets installed by laminating it into the structure of any piece of industrial equipment, requiring little to no modification of the equipment itself. And it works by measuring the minute deflections of that structure at multiple points and in multiple dimensions, and then uses sensor fusion to reconstruct the external forces being applied to the equipment. As a simple example, let's say you wanted to measure the force applied to your smartphone. I would laminate force film to the bottom of the phone, right next to where I'm gripping it. And then because it's a non-contact sensor, I would be able to measure the force applied to the top of the phone. And because it's a multi-point sensor, I can tell exactly where that force is being applied. And because it's a multi-dimensional sensor, I can even tell if the forces were to be applied at the side of the phone or if the phone were to be twisted or bent. And this paper thin profile enables installations into incredibly compact spaces like on bearings and gearboxes. And this provides both the static and isolated dynamic forces that vibration sensors just can't capture. And these measurements enable a far more accurate insight into the health of your equipment. And the force film platform is already industrial IoT ready with a fully digital signal output. And force film has been designed from the ground up for harsh industrial environments, allowing it to handle forces up to and beyond multi-ton loads, measuring any number of points in complex alignment applications, such as those in mold and dye, uh, operating over a huge temperature range in dirty and even wet environments, and not being affected by nearby electrical noise from motors, solenoids, or even welding. And finally, force film can be used for very sensitive complex manipulation and assembly in robotics. It's six plus degrees of freedom can measure complex interactions 
uh, even including traditional joint torque sensing and force torque sensing. It can match human touch for delicate tasks, and its multi-point sensing allows it to detect if a part is slipping or misaligned. And all this capability combined enables robots and equipment to actively adapt between different tasks and components in high mix flexible manufacturing. And this ultimately reduces setup time and increases equipment utilization. So thank you for listening and please reach out to us to learn more about how we can add value to your industrial process. Perfect, well, thank you for this insightful presentation. Um, I think we can carry on with the event. Um, I'm sure everyone loves to know where their belongings are at all times. Uh, Pascal Tags enables a data-driven supply chain through a chipless inventory tag system for every stage from manufacturing to the end user and everywhere in between. Um, Team Pascal, we are all eager to learn from uh, learn more about what you are working on. So please take it away. My name is Brandon Young. I'm the founder and CEO of Pascal Tags. What we do is we directly help solve a massive problem in the inventory space where companies aren't able to get the data and efficiency needed throughout their entire supply chain, where they use billions upon billions of dollars each year due to this lack of information and efficiency, as the only current options are a very elementary solution of barcode or a very complex and convoluted solution of RFID and Bluetooth. And these cause major pain points in the manufacturing, logistics, retail, and home application. And this is because the current solutions are focusing on a very, um, a very simplistic approach of if you're going to have any functionality in a tag, you have to have active elements. And this, uh, in our opinion, naive thought is something that has really hindered the industry and needs to be directly tackled to solve the problem. And what our company does is we're able to remove this sort of complexity by having a completely passive tag, but because of the conductive and non-conductive materials we have, we're able to create a unique response that can be picked up via our detectors that can actually create the functionality of detection through objects and omnidirectionality that is needed at a very cost effective price. And how we compare to our competitors is we're able to have the functionality needed at a cost effective rate that is very simplistic that companies need to be able to know what's truly going on in their supply chain. We've been able to evaluate this with two Fortune 700 level companies of Geo Appliances and Brown Foreman. And we're looking to kind of expand our pilots from the products that are a thousand thousands upon thousands of dollars as we've, as we've been able to show the value of our product. And then now we're looking for pilots of products that are very cost effective to show this, we have this full spectrum uh, potential viability. In terms of funding, we've been able to um, receive over $450,000 from pitch competitions and uh, NSF SBIRs. And then we plan on raising $1.5 million over the next year, starting as of right now, around March of next year, over our roadmap has been focusing on um, expanding our initial validation of this year, getting the optimization the year after in 2022, really being ready with a scalable manufacturing method in 2022. Our vision is focusing on entirely the thought of cradle to grave inventory tag, a single tag for products life from the manufacturing through the logistics to the uh, retailer, and then all the way potentially into the consumer's home. Though, as of right now, we're focusing on perfecting the manufacturing. We have a very established team in this industry. And we have, uh, not only on the business side, but on the technical side, expanding ourselves so that we can tackle any problem. Again, my name is Brandon Young, Pasco Tags, a smarter way to inventory. Perfect. Well. Thank you so much for being with us today. And now we can move on to Work24. Uh, Work24 digitizes technical drawings and accesses key information of said drawings, allowing machine builders and manufacturers to accelerate their processes. Um, let's hear about what uh, that means and uh, let's hear about that in more detail. And let's welcome team Work24. Please, it's all you now. Hi, my name is Jay from VEX24. And we can now spend the next four minutes talking about technical drawings and business automation. So most manufacturers have uh, adopted 3D models for their processes. But interestingly enough, the technical drawing st is still around and I believe it will stay around for a very long time. 
Basically, because it contains very, very crucial information. It contains the product manufacturing information, the PMI. If you try to manufacture something without a PMI, you're going to end up with a product that looks like a 3D model, but it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. It's not going to be fit for purpose. So accessing the information on a technical drawing is crucial. The problem with that is that um, the technical drawing comes in formats that are easy for humans to understand. They come, for example, as image or as PDF, but these formats are extremely difficult for machines to understand. Now, what that means is that any time that you have a process that wants to access or needs to access information from a technical drawing, then this process is going to be a very manual one. And what, that, uh, what 24 does is it takes a technical drawing as input value and then applies an artificial intelligence to look at the technical drawing pretty much the same way as a human would. And it extracts all the relevant information that you need for your business process. That could, for example, be the measures, the tolerances, the fits, the threads, the surfaces, and so on. Now, there's a wide range of, of use cases that you can describe. There's, for example, the situation where you want to automate your uh, ERP data entry. Or you might want to check whether the technical drawing that your customer sent you is actually feasible with the machines that you have. But my favorite one is the generation of instant quotes. That's my favorite one because we see a, a large number, an increasing number of online manufacturers that are entering that space. And we see um, a larger number of initiatives uh, within um, manufacturers and traders that also offer a flavor of instant protein. If you have colleagues that are involved in these projects, we would greatly appreciate an introduction because having access to these technical drawings and having access to the information that is stored into them can give you a crucial market advantage. The PMI can affect the price that you're quoting to your customer by a factor of 10. So if there's any, anyone uh, working in your company with these projects, we would greatly appreciate an introduction. Awesome, well, that was work 24 and I think now once again, it's a good moment to take a Q&A break and dive deeper into some of the things that were just covered. And for that, one more time, I would love to invite my colleague, Addison, to take care of that. Addison, are you still with us? Hi there, I am absolutely still here. Thanks, Giannis, and thanks to these five presenters. Hopefully we should have them on the screen here shortly for us all to ask some great questions. So be sure to start submitting those to the Q&A box. Awesome. It looks like I'm starting to see a few of you. Let me kind of kick things off by um, restating that I know we saw that at least Oloid and Clarify directly addressed the way the pandemic has accelerated their business. But I'm curious for all of you about the major changes you've seen shifting to virtual and if you have any learnings that will kind of continue forward into the new future or the foreseeable future. Anything immediately jump out to you? Yeah, I can speak again from all the way standpoint that we are investing into the future of the workplace. And we believe that both uh, the cognitive knowledge worker and the industrial worker, their work environment is going to evolve and adapt to a new normal. Uh, for the cognitive worker, we are seeing a mobile device as a proxy for the worker's identity, either through Bluetooth, NFC, or QR codes. And we are seeing industrial workers starting to use more advanced identification techniques, uh, contactless biometrics. So we believe that uh, you know, all our customers and their CIOs and CISOs agree that never waste a crisis. And we believe that it's going to accelerate the movement towards a more holistic and integrated contactless identity management for the workers. Awesome. 
Awesome. And how about for the rest of you? Have there been any major learnings this pandemic that you think you could pass on to the other startups and even the corporations in the audience today? Uh, one of the things that we've seen at Forsen is really a really a push to automate more and more tasks. You know, day to day, you you don't think much of it, but having a robot do everything from pick up and put a part into a machine or do a little bit of checking here and there automates quite a bit of work. And now that people can't stand as close to each other and need to work in cells, robots are filling the gap. So I think we're seeing more and more opportunities for robots to perform simple tasks and automate work. And part of that is tasks that maybe we didn't think of, something that might be delicate uh, or that you didn't think to automate in the past. So we've seen a lot of that, especially in anything logistics and manufacturing, where there's still a, you know, there's a huge demand right now, but you just can't pack more people into the factory to make things happen. So now we're seeing the sort of the power that robots can have in that space. Awesome. And I think one thing you touch on there that's applicable to a bunch of people in this panel is that you're working with hardware, you're working with real tangible goods, rather than some of the software we've seen so far today. So I'm curious, coming from that perspective of working on tangible products, um, what are some hurdles you face that you've maybe learned to overcome, maybe help other hardware startups in the audience with their development process or how to work with some of these larger corporations when you're dealing with a hardware product? Any advice or lessons? I can I guess, just jump into, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I think um, for us, because I know we work with um, decently large companies in the Fortune 500, 700 space, is we went in very, very early with them. And being able to have, um, I think, something that is, um, even though it was a proof of concept, but something that is very early on, allows them to kind of see the benefit of a lot of our initial approach isn't going to be more for a scalable uh, product or product in our case, where we have something that's more custom for them. And it allows, I think, especially during a pandemic for them to kind of buy in earlier um, in our case where these companies kind of see the benefit of um, if we're kind of working independently, working with kind of a custom solution, it allows us to build something that is custom to them and they see the value um, pretty quickly as we can kind of work alone, especially in a lot of the manufacturers we work with. And for us, we, on, on a, a bit of a similar note, we've seen a lot of, oh, am I frozen there? Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of, you have to really make things work out of the box. And part of that can be customizing it to the customer's application. So it's, you know, it needs to match our bolt pattern, our communication protocol, our power requirements, uh, because they, yeah, that you, you aren't there in person to help them set it up. Uh, and then the other is figuring out how you're going to make your solution as a uh, plug and play, if, if I can use that term as possible, so that they open the box, they see how to use it. So from the time they get the box on site, they open it, take it, plug it in, get data out of it. How fast and seamless is that process? Because the only power that you have now as a startup is, video conferencing. You can't touch it. You can't plug the cable in for them. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you can't remote into their PC because uh, especially large corporations, uh, you know, they have security concerns. So really streamlining that process for the customer is important. So we've been investing a lot of effort into our demo units to make them easier to integrate. Awesome. Um, and one thing you brought up, Brandon, that was, I think, really key to this discussion is the concept of POCs and pilot projects. I think we have a lot of corporations in the audience that that's the best first step to work with startups like yourself. So I'm curious kind of what you wish corporations would have in place to have the most, you know, streamlined POC project or the best chance of working well with you guys. Is there anything you've seen in the past that works really well in terms of setting up those POCs and pilots? 
I think it really depends. I know um, for us in particular, where I've tried to diversify, diversify who are um, who we're using in terms of our pilot programs, and we have one company that's in a very old old industry that's basically still in the 1800s of spirits and in the bourbon industry. And we have another of G appliances, which is more very modern and cutting edge. And one thing that I've seen was really beneficial for us is with Brown Foreman in particular, even though they're a little bit more old school, is that they gave us um, the proper contacts um, at first, where they have a little bit more experience dealing with um, kind of in the manufacturing environment versus it took about two or three months to find the right contacts to get the direct answers and that's something that I've always tried focusing on is making sure you show demos, you get feedback, you show the final product to the uh, not only the appropriate stakeholders, but the end user. Awesome. And any last words on pilots or POCs setting it up from any of our other panelists before we move on? Uh, yes. I'll well, <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that, that we really uh, learned throughout this pandemic is that uh, besides of the shift that I was talking about in the presentation earlier, uh, is that working with corporate pilots allows you to learn faster um, and develop uh, faster, uh, more, uh, develop more value faster towards the end users uh, than if you would go on a smaller basis. Also, because you get to learn how the product would move around within a very structured, organized environment. And that's different than working with uh, smaller uh, corporations. So uh, it allows us uh, to, to not only uh, skill faster, but also develop faster uh, uh, based on the needs that the uh, end user is, uh, yeah, is wishing for. And if I could add, I think in this pilot POC's feature functionality is one side of it. What you know, we also work with Fortune 500s and large manufacturers, and they're also looking for a solution that will scale. So constructing a POC and pilot such that although it's done in a small confined environment, how are you able to demonstrate the support processes, integrations, showing how data flows in a secure manner? Uh, I think it only uh, helps the startups to invest early into those areas and not leave it for later. It just helps accelerate deals and create more confidence with the customers in my experience. Awesome. Well, I hate to shift gears here, but we do have some burning questions coming in from the audience that I definitely want to address. Um, the first, let me start with force N. Perhaps you could describe more what the dynamic range of force on the film that can be detected is. What's the sensitivity of the sensors and the frequency it can measure with? Let me know if I need to repeat any of those. That was a lot all at once. <laughs> yes, no problem. So our sensor is scalable in terms of range. So we can go from anything as sensitive as a human hand and even a little uh, uh, below that, so superhuman, all the way up to multi-ton loads. And the way we do that is our sensor is uh, attaches to the structure and it's measuring how much that structure moves. So the bigger the tool that you want to measure, the larger the range that you're gonna get. Uh, and we are able to do update rates up to 10 kilohertz uh, for each of the data points with incredibly low latency. And another thing to note with our sensor is uh, we talk about the measurement range, we can independently create an overload, uh, a much higher overload than that. So if you have, if you wanna be able to measure something with the sensitivity of human touch, but you're worried about that sensor then getting smacked into a wall by accident at some point and breaking, we can do both at the same time. Now, which one of, which one of the questions did I forget? Did I get all of them? I think you got all of them. Maybe can you adjust the frequency that it can measure with? Oh yeah, the 10 kilohertz, up to 10 kilohertz. Awesome. Um, I think you nailed all of them. I'm sure they will let me know at the Q&A if I ran into anything else. Um, to keep us on the um, sort of technical through line, maybe let's address a few of these for Pascal tags that are popping up. Um, if you could um, describe a little bit more detail the technology you're using in the tag, and I think that will help to address the other concern, which is about battery life of the tag. Got it. So. Um, our proprietary technology, we use uh, conductive and non-conductive material. So we're able to have no chip, no battery, no active electronics. So we're able to have, I don't like this term, but a better barcode where we can actually use magnetic fields and the actual response of uh, 
the material response to build the omnidirectionality and detection through objects. So basically, we we don't have a battery or any other active electronics like RFID, which has a chip, even in its simplistic in its most simplistic form, or Bluetooth, which obviously has um, electronics inside. Yeah, appreciate that clarification. And I think there's also a question here about if you need to build a certain network or um, have a certain network to read Pascal tags. Maybe you could address that as well. So as of right now, we are um, there is not a custom network. So our detectors handle most of the processing. Um, any sort of um, custom network, we're trying to remove that need and be for the pun, I guess, of uh, as plug and play as possible. And eventually, longer term, we want to be completely connected to um, kind of 5G, Wi-Fi, and that sort of thing. But right now, it's there's no additional network or really anything needed um, on the uh, consumer end. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and I think maybe a question for the folks like Oloid and Clarify, and maybe I think even Work24 fits in this bucket, where your solutions are helping people do things remotely or return back to the office. Have you seen any kind of increase in demand due to the pandemic? And how have you handled that as such lean startup teams? Yeah, certainly from a return to work perspective, Oloid has been focusing on that uh, enablement of the industry in a big way. And for us, the traction has been tremendous around how to get essential workers continue to work either in meatpacking industry or in industrial environments, which are very essential to keep the economy running, then how do you create safety and security at the same time? So organizations, they were starting to leave their doors open because they didn't want people to touch fingerprint or handles. And we have enabled contactless access and authorization uh, using tablets and complete software centric approach. So for us, the speed at which we could execute and implement has been a great partnership with our customers in enabling return to work for their industrial workers. Yeah, in addition to that, uh, we've experienced that there is a lot of demand for high quality data uh, with specifics on, for example, uh, aerosols that we are detecting now with our sensor. That's very interesting because a lot of facility and asset managers that we get in touch with uh, seem to be uh, more skeptical about, uh, for example, using CO2 as a proxy uh, on how polluted the room actually is, well, we can provide more detail on the actual situation. So given that data, uh, they can make more rational decisions on how to steer, for example, the ventilation in the room, but also how to draft up more accurate policies that fit to the situation with, for example, the occupancy rate of when people need to go back, how many can you actually allow into a certain space those are questions that were often blanks and that we are able to help them uh, address and fill up more correctly than they were able to do before. So that's very interesting when it comes to the demand side. Uh, and also it gives us a better product fit than before because the market changed from uh, being focused on energy reduction to creating a more healthy environment. And that's something that's lasting. So that's very promising, uh, not only to us, but also to other companies and startups that are active in this field. Yeah, for us, we have, we have seen a um, pickup in demand as well, uh, mainly because um, what we do, what we see, is that a lot of people are changing their processes um, right now. And if you're in a process of changing your process, why not automate it? So I think that um, fits together quite well as such. Awesome. And maybe kind of staying on the subject of these lean startup teams, a question I can open up to maybe the entire group is how have you maintained your teams moving to virtual as managers of these um, lean startup teams? Um, and especially since you either work on you know, hardware development or somehow touch physical products, even, you know, I know Work24 is helping people develop hardware. Has that been difficult maintaining virtual teams and how have you sort of managed that and what sort of best practices can you bring to the group? Strong communication and uh, setting clear expectations is very important. So for example, one of the things that I do with my team is have a stand-up call every morning of half an hour and discuss uh, on what we've done the day before, uh, what uh, milestones we have achieved and what's in front of us. So we make uh, sprints, for example, on the technology aspect on a weekly basis and set the goals on Mondays. And the same goes for business development. I think that's one of the things that, that is very uh, necessary if you're working uh, from home uh, and, and develop your product alongside uh, your business. Uh, so that's one of the key takeaways that I got over the last months. 
and building on that, Oloid is a geographically distributed team. We actually have a pretty sizable team in Bangalore. So we already had some systems set up for remote collaboration. And then the US team is now all virtual and remote. So I think we have adapted pretty well to this remote collaboration. In fact, the speed at which we delivered some new functionality, which were enabling return to work, like integrating thermal scanning to our core product or integrating uh, the wellness attestations as employees answer questions, we released products at 50% of the time that we would have taken last year just because we were working on a very efficient 24 hour cycle. The US team would have very clear communication you know, to uh, the point that was made earlier with the remote team and making sure we have Slack and multi-channel Skype and video collaboration in place. So I think our productivity has imp improved significantly because of embracing the remote model in a full 100% commitment. Awesome, awesome. And maybe we have time for one more slightly technical question. We have one coming in for you, Force In. Um, are you at the prototyping stage or a commercial product stage? Uh, we're at both. So we can be your partner for everything from custom or semi-custom prototypes all the way to large scale manufacturing. So we will do you know, anything as small as just customizing the bolt pattern so that it integrates directly to your robot uh, so that you can ramp that up into manufacturing to doing custom integrations into custom parts in your robot. And then again, scaling that up for you. Uh, so love to, to talk with uh, Tom uh, about how we can help you guys scale for sensors in your process. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Unfortunately, that's about all the time we have for questions today, um, but I appreciate your presentations and taking the time to dig in here a little bit deeper with us. Um, but I think for now, I will pass it back to Giannis to continue on with the story. Wow, well, thanks everyone. And thank you, Addison, for conducting this. Honestly, I don't know what we would be doing here without you. So thank you so much. Uh, but now I think we can proceed with the event and our next company will be Increment. Um, Industry 4.0 is a buzzword we've all heard about, but it's not always easy to train your workforce according to the new paradigm. Our next presenter uh, has built a tracking platform of internal on-the-job upskilling for industrial workers in order to help manufacturers and workers adapt to Industry 4.0. Team Increment, it's your turn to shine. Uh, please uh, welcome them with a round of applause, everyone. Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm the founder and CEO of Increment. We digitize the impact of industrial skills progression on production output for manufacturing workers. The common narrative is that automation is simply displacing industrial workers, but automation is actually shifting the skills uh, manufacturers need to more advanced technology-enabled skill sets, and manufacturers are actually having a very hard time hiring for these externally currently, and look to upskill their current workforce to meet these production demands. However, these processes are mostly currently offline and impossible to tie to production metrics uh, and errors. This uh, quote shows that one of the manufacturers that we're working with, their plant, is uh, losing around a million dollars a year alone just due to these very retrainable errors made and has no way to understand um, when training and upskilling should occur to reduce errors. And so you extrapolate this to 250,000 US manufacturers, that's hundreds of billions of dollars lost. Um, and you can see kind of these two dynamics of manufacturing owners want to reduce those costs uh, and factory floor workers want to learn new skill sets, understand how to get to that next wage or role level. And so how do we help manufacturers understand the ROI of their training and um, upskill workers? And so right now, you know, they need to know how to up cross train workers, fill in gaps long term as the conversation about strengthening U.S. manufacturing increases. Uh, upskilling and training is a top area for that. So there's an opportunity to reinvent this area. And so Increment digitizes shop floor upskilling and retraining to map to production output. Phase one is the skills uh, data foundation and phase two is tying that to specific quality and production metrics. And so creating this foundation will allow us to decrease the number of very retrainable worker errors made, which decreases the costs for the manufacturers, allow manufacturers to uh, have workers uh, more successfully map out paths to upskill and cross train, move into advanced manufacturing roles, and apply machine learning and other advanced techniques to surface under the radar workers and predict when errors will be made. 
And so we're confirming two paid pilots in Indiana uh, and have numerous um, workforce and economic uh, organization partnerships as well. And we'll be launching in early next year. And so we have a strong background in software product development, uh, engineering at companies such as Stripe, uh, as well as you know, diverse perspectives in South Bend and in manufacturing, which will really allow us to tackle this. Um, and we built our foundation in South Bend, Indiana. We were recently accepted into Techstars that actually started this week. Uh, our other backers are Comeback Capital, Vonti Kapoor, um, Aspen Institute Tech Policy Hub. So we're really excited to build on our foundation and uh, continue to uh, move uh, our progress forward. So if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, um, uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Awesome. Well, that was increments and now click, click, we move on to click. Uh, with great technology comes great responsibility to sell it. Uh, the next presenter, Click, helps B2B sales representatives close more deals and build better relationships with their customers. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to welcome the team from Click to tell us more about their product. Please, the virtual stage is yours. Click. Hey, everybody. My name is Paul Tkach, and I'm one of the co-founding members here at Click, a global leader in industrial sales enablement software. And over the next three minutes, I'll be discussing some of the challenges modern teams face in this new landscape of digital selling. According to Salesforce, 79% of buyers say it's absolutely critical that they interact with a salesperson who is a trusted advisor, while 82% of buyers said they viewed at least five pieces of content before making a purchasing decision. Now, it's safe to say that even before COVID, the landscape of sales was changing drastically. Buyers are more informed than ever with access to thousands of resources online, raising the bar much higher for sellers. And to make matters more difficult, in 2019, we saw sales professionals spend just 34% of their time actually selling while most of it was wasted on administrative and preparation tasks. And I'm sure we've all been there before at some point in our lives, clicking endlessly through folders looking for a file. Folder structures don't work, and they're not suited for business-to-business -business models. They're complex, they create a lot of friction, and they're extremely difficult to manage, especially when we're dealing with multiple revisions or languages at a global and local level. That's why we built Click, a powerful yet simple platform that uses your data to recommend content and empower better sales conversations. Click digitally enables your team by transforming your content into conversations, your data into direction, and your sales reps into sales experts. We ensure that your sales teams always have the right content at the right time, enabling better customer conversations. The same way that Amazon and Netflix make suggestions based off of your history and your favorites, Click understands your content needs and recommends the best collateral for you to use at your upcoming meeting or opportunity. And we stray away from that traditional folder style structure to eliminate the redundancy of clicking through multiple levels. Instead, Click's platform intelligently aggregates large libraries of sales content into simple categories and then uses data insights and advanced filters to help your team ensure that they always have the right content at the right time, regardless of where they are, eliminating the overwhelming task of sorting through thousands of documents. And with Click, users also have the ability to instantly mix and match different pieces of content together to make their own unique tailored presentations, which can be shared directly with customers or prospects. And one of the best parts about sharing content directly from Click is that we track analytics to help your team get a better understanding of engagement, of how customers and prospects are engaging with your content, but how your team's using it on a daily basis as well. Working with some of our industrial partners, we've seen an 80% reduction in the time it takes for sales rep to find content which has also led to an additional 20 hours of face-to-face -face selling interactions per month. Some background information on our team. We have a proven expertise serving enterprise organizations with global deployments, and we have a deep domain of expertise within industrials, which is comprised of leadership from companies at General Electric and FlowServe. We have large partnerships right now with some leading industrial and life sciences companies, including Honeywell and Mettler. Uh, and to date, we've done seed funding, but we're working towards a Series A in 2021. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to connecting with all of you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I think now we can jump into the next one. Uh, machine learning predicts relatively narrowly defined outcomes, but good decision making requires broader context that these models can't really capture. Our next presenter uh, from Decision AI lets data scientists integrate machine learning with other sources of knowledge into more holistic models of your business. Without any further ado, let's welcome the team from Decision AI. Hi, I'm Dan Becker, founder and CEO of Decision AI. 
we help companies take the AI models that they build in Data Robot or H2O or uh, in raw Python and turn them into better real world results. So uh, a bit about us. So first of all, the team is myself. Uh, I was an early employee and the director of product at Data Robot. I was a data scientist at Google for, for several years. Have done well in machine learning competitions. Uh, my uh, first person I hired at Decision AI is Colin Morris. He was previously the first person who I hired uh, when I was at Google. And before that, he was an engineering manager uh, at Apple, um, working with Thomas Whitehead, who uh, was in charge of design the early days of Data Robot. And we have some, some investors who are the most respected names in the field of AI. The problem that we're solving is that machine learning models forecast or model very narrow slices of a business. And so you have these silos around your models that prevent you from combining them and seeing the big picture. And that causes data scientists as a whole to frequently be narrowed in on improving individual metrics that don't matter to the rest of the business. When what we'd like them to do is be able to bring together multiple machine learning models into a holistic simulation of how their business operates so that they can make decisions that move the bottom line outcomes, not just data science outcomes, but true big picture outcomes for the business. We do this with a web-based app. And you can see an example of the web app here. It's quite easy to use. You can use these formulas, which really are Excel-like formulas, specifying how these models fit together and, and how um, yeah, the, the meaning of each of them and how they relate. Um, and then actually bring in the models. You can build models using tools like H2O, Data Robot, Python, Scikit-Learn, or Tensor, Google's TensorFlow. Um, give those names, and then just upload the model files uh, using this drag and drop interface. Specify again how they fit together using some quite simple uh, formulas, and then you can see the impact of different decisions that you might make on the business as a whole. So um, happy to share more context. Uh, but this is useful for most teams that are using machine learning on tables of data today. Uh, so happy to happy to connect in the future. Wonderful. Well, what a great decision it was to build exactly what you are building. Best of luck with that. And thank you so much for being with us here today. Now let's proceed with Reflect. Um, nowadays, when a lot of work is still being conducted remotely, it's very important to have a solution for remote maintenance and training. Well, look no further because the next presenter from Reflect has built an augmented reality platform for maintenance, operations, and training. Please, Team Reflect, take it away. Hi there, my name is Kareem. I'm COO and co-founder of Reflect, a Munich-based software company focusing on augmented reality for enterprises. Our vision is to make operating and maintaining complex machinery as easy as using a simple home appliance. We believe that any operations and maintenance procedure and workflow, no matter how complicated and extensive they, uh, they are, will lose complexity if the right contextual information and the proper visual guidance is provided. So what is the problem we are solving and what our customers are facing? Products, machine, and facilities are getting more and more complex. Specialist knowledge required to operate and maintain this kind of equipment is very hard to find. Qualified engineers are also very expensive to train. What makes it even more difficult is the fact that we are dealing with vast amounts of hyperdynamic data generated through IoT or AI, the extensive networking of devices, as well as a high rate of change with cloud-based applications. So it's almost impossible for an individual frontline worker to deal with all this information and also to perform properly their task they have to do. So we want to shift traditional manuals towards an augmented reality workspace an augmented reality based assistance system. So therefore we developed two tools. Reflect Remote, it's a real time expert collaboration tool to remotely support a technician on site. And Reflect One, it's a content creation platform allowing enterprises to reuse existing data from their PLM system, from their XML based authoring systems, such as CAD files, technical drawings, repair manuals, instructions, and so on and so forth. 
you will see from the selection of our customers that independently from the verticals they are active and also independently from the size of these companies, they're all dealing with the same challenges. We founded the company back in 2012 at the beginning as a service agency and developed over 200 projects for, for the industry in the meanwhile. So the learnings and the experience of these 200 projects we fed back to our two products, Reflect One and Reflect Remote. In the meanwhile, we are 53 um, employees um, located in two offices. Our headquarters is in Munich, Germany, and we have a second subsidiary in Sunnyvale, California. So if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. I would be more than happy to get in touch with you. So please um, feel free and don't hesitate to contact us if you have further questions. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye. Perfect. Well, have a second to still reflect on what you just heard from Reflect. Uh, but now let's jump into the next presentation. Not all heroes wear capes. Some heroes simply do the Lord's work when it comes to tedious and time consuming process automation. The next presenter takes RPA, combines that with AI to do exactly that. Uh, you will see that they are not wearing a cape once they get on the virtual stage, but you will definitely learn that they do some fantastic work in the automation space. Please, the stage is all yours and tell us more about what Automation Hero does. Hey there, my name is Freddy and I'm head of strategic partnerships at Automation Hero. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to present to you today. Automation Hero is a true end-to-end -end intelligent process automation company for the enterprise. Now, the future is autonomous. We see this with autonomous manufacturing, autonomous warehousing, autonomous vehicles. And what's next? Autonomous business processes. One technology has predominantly really been around in the market in the last couple of years, which is RPA or robotic process automation. However, after being in the market, this technology really has hit a wall. And we see this with a lack of true AI capabilities versus newer platforms having deep learning integrated and in native, natively built in. We see this with a high amount of fragmented tools that are to be stitched together versus really having everything built from the ground up in one end-to-end -end platform. And we see this with a lack of enterprise readiness versus nowadays platforms really show an enterprise grade readiness for scaling enterprise-wide within the company. Now, Gardner also sees that, that issue and calls it hyper-automation and puts it at the beginning point, really the, the automation of very simple tasks and very simple processes with structured data only, but really then seeing that progress all the way to hyper automation, combining all these different technologies, RPA, workflow management, event processing, the ability to handle large amounts of data. And then of course, intelligence is a very important part, AI, NLP algorithms, deep learning, etc. ending really with the integration of process intelligence. And here we are a true hyper automation platform that covers all these technologies end to end. At Automation Hero, we cover the entire process. We start with the human, we loop in all sorts of um, documents or other unstructured data sources. We bring in the workflow capacity, we bring in, in integration and of course insights. And how do we do this? Well, this is with the five different modules that we have in our platform, our UX studio, our intelligent OCR and AI studio, and of course our flow studio that allows you in a no-code environment to click together your own automations and our connectors and of course our process mining capability that we call Hero Sonar. Some of the AI models that large corporations include in their processes nowadays are intent detection, dark data extraction, intelligent OCR prediction models, classification models, optic detection, all the way to even reinforcement learning. On the use case side, we, we see a lot of different enterprise-wide use cases, right? That we can tackle with one end-to-end -end platform. That starts with repetitive tasks on the data entry level, data, data validation that goes on onto documents, document creation and this is all three different types of documents structured CMS structured unstructured it's document understanding it's intelligent OCR text classification we speaking about AI based decision making in the workflow piece that we can combine with rule based decision making and of course on the integration side we can integrate and connect to any system we can route data through the workflow we can update record in events on the inside side here in the end we, we understand the processes we can find them um, automation opportunities with real time process KPIs and of course, uh, business APIs. This is Automation Hero. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm now happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much, Automation Hero. And this was the last company that's in the program. 
Um, I think there are still some questions that might need to be addressed. And for that, once again, um, Addison, I think you would be the best person to do this. So please, uh, let's jump into the Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Giannis. Um, and thanks to these five companies for presenting for us today. Our last set. Um, so let's definitely make this Q&A session count. Feel free to submit any of your questions in the Q&A box below. In the meantime, maybe I can kick us off with a few questions to get us started. Um, so when I look at these startups, it seems like you're all really focused on the future of work. Um, one thing I'd love to know, considering our audience here today is a lot of industrial companies, what do you see as sort of the future of the industrial enterprise and how do you see your company fitting into that vision? Yeah, I think I can start us off there. So I think that just from our perspective at Click here, uh, helping teams work remotely and use their content more effectively when they're in the fields or doing virtual calls, uh, we're starting to notice teams are getting more, uh, I guess, they're adapting well to these, these virtual processes and I'm starting to develop their sales and marketing processes that align with more of a virtual work from home environment. So going forward, I think that we're going to continue to see a lot of teams working remotely and, and continuing to do their work virtually. Um, and we're going to continue to see new technologies. I mean, there's some great ones today that have been presented, uh, continue to see these be implemented, things like augmented reality for training, um, other types of platforms that help teams connect remotely with customers. Um, I think that this has really accelerated a lot of digitalization for companies, and that's that is what we're seeing, especially with the, uh, the industri industrial industry right now, um, which was probably a couple steps behind adapting technologies. Awesome, thanks. And how about for the rest of you? Any thoughts on what the industrial enterprise could look like um, with automation and more of these future technologies, and sort of how you're working to address that? If not, no worries. I think another sort of question I'm curious about is a lot of your solutions are applicable across many different industries, um, as opposed to some of the more specific solutions we've seen earlier today. Um, so I'm curious if you've seen patterns in the industries that are really able to adopt te new technologies rapidly and any sort of learnings that our other inter enterprises that are here today can take from those experiences. Is there any industry that specifically adopts things really well and you'd love if every industry could be so rapid? I guess I can chime in there. I think it's actually a little bit opposite for us. We find that the adoption for um, the industrial industry is a little bit slower right now because a lot of teams didn't have traditional technologies in place like CRMs or other platforms part of their technology stacks. These just weren't necessary things in the past. But I think a lot of teams are starting to see the value in data and the value of CRMs. So they're starting to implement these technologies a lot more. Um, so I think that from that standpoint, we're, we're starting to see teams just, just take on these technologies and begin to use them a lot more frequently. Yeah, I'll have to second with with Paul on that. You know, I think that um, although we, we are digitizing this, this new process and system for these manufacturers and, and industry, um, you know, what we're seeing is they're they're not just willing to accept this new, you know, this world of tech and innovation for them, but they're they're willing to work with us. You know, a lot of our clients we're working with building our pilots with and they're super excited about it and they're they're asking questions about the future. And so I would say it's been it's been quite an amazing process right now. Yeah, I know for us, um, and, and part of the part of this is uh, the part the type of innovation that we do at Decision AI um, is something that's quickly adopted by financial services and, and fintech. Um, one of the things that I've seen there is they're very willing to try um, some new technology at a small scale have a way of measuring the effectiveness of it. And that's sort of the, and so they don't need to adopt something at a large scale. They have a, a way of basically doing um, quick, quick pilots and measuring the effectiveness of those. Um, and that's something that, that I think as other um, industries to, to, to follow that way of doing pilots um, and measure them quite as well, that'll, um, that'll accelerate their adoption. Just to, to add on to that, that's something that we've seen a lot of success with as well. And I, I totally agree with that, especially working with industrial manufacturing companies, uh, starting small, starting local um, and figuring out what problem are we solving? What challenge are we tackling here? And then proving that works on a local deployment. Uh, and then from there, once that's proven out, it's much, much easier to scale up to other divisions and, and other parts of that organization. Uh, but I couldn't agree more. I think that starting at a local level and then scaling up to, to a global level 
um, it has been really effective in our shoes at least. Awesome. And it feels like we're, you know, merging into that discussion topic of things like pilots and POCs, which I know I mentioned earlier is a way a lot of our corporations here first get involved with startups. So on this sort of enterprise level where it's not a product or it's not necessarily a product innovation, what do teams need to have in place to really take advantage of your solutions? Um, where, what should they be prepared for and how can they best tackle these types of problems? Yeah, for, for decision AI, it is, uh, they need to have already experimented with machine learning and it is fine if they've experimented with machine learning, found that um, it was not really applicable to the rest of the business, but they've, they've at least sort of run some of these pilots and potentially with other firms. And that's sort of the, the first step of, of them seeing what the problems were, which we can help them address. Yeah, let, let me chime in here as well as a, as a fellow AI company, I think. Uh, for, for us, it's not necessarily important that the customer has already experienced or hasn't made experiences with, um, with AI um, and models themselves, but they need to have data in place, right? And, and data really is, is the key factor for, for training good AI models. And this should be, um, this should be established on, on the customer side, especially if they want to move into AI topics and machine, machine learning topics. Yeah, for, for an increment, I would say that they need to have some type of error management system already in place. Um, obviously, most of them are paper and pencil at, at the moment, which is why we're here. Um, but they have to also have some type of interest in upscaling and upskilling their employees. And so that when we come in, we have like a more of a, a Palantir model where we're actually kind of like 80% customizable, 20%, you know, um, structured so we're, we're you know we start off our pilots as a co-creation and consulting um and then we make sure that their their solution is tailored to them awesome and maybe addressing the elephant in the room has any part of this process changed now that we've moved to a more virtual world during this pandemic um have you seen you've had to either change the way you interact with companies or that they've changed their strategies in this domain now that everything is remote work For Click, it has a little bit. Uh, we've seen an acceleration of people requiring our, our technologies right now to connect remotely with their customers. But what we used to do is in-person training. So we would be able to actually train the entire workforce on how to use our technology um, from your mobile device or from your computer. But what we've had to adapt and swap over to now is uh, more of a train the trainer model. So we are training somebody at these companies virtually um, who then goes out and trains the rest of the, the, the teams there. So uh, we're finding that has been a little bit more of a self-sustainable model where you actually have someone on the other side who has a really clear, good understanding of our solution and what to do. Um, and there are that point of contact there. So that, that's how it's changed a little bit for us, but it's also accelerated it in a positive way. Awesome. And I think kind of staying on that same, same vein, a lot of corporations could actually stand to learn something from the way startups are managing their teams during this time, because a lot of startups have seen such explosive growth. Do you guys have any best practices of how you've managed moving to a remote world, whether it's your sales process or even just managing your teams? Yeah, for us, we're still so small that uh, I think we have a different set of challenges and and to be honest, I don't, I don't think that that uh, we have any insights for for larger companies because we're just dealing with different different sets of problems. Yeah, we're we're quite small as well, and, and like like you guys uh, heard in the in the pitch earlier from Jess, we are, we're in tech stars at the moment, and so uh, we have a lot of things that we're we're getting in terms of resources and, and potential clients. Um, our team is quite small, um, and right now we're kind of just trying to sift through who are the perfect people to have on the team and, and our advisory board as well. We're, we're a very, we're yeah. a pretty small team about, um, a small, small team. We've got about 20, 20 on our team and we work remotely between um, two different continents. And uh, we've worked a little bit remotely before this all, all kind of fell into place. But I think a couple of just generic things that we do really well and I think a lot of teams can do as well and, and take note from is just clear communication uh, between teams, right? And clear responsibility. So what teams are responsible for what? I think that a lot of teams mix up their expectations and things can get blurred, especially when you're working from home and you don't have those in-face uh, meetings or those maybe quick chats where you can just say something to somebody over at their desk. Um, so really having clear expectations, clear um, 
I guess, um, expectations from each team and communication on a rigorous basis, whether those are weekly meetings or follow-up meetings for certain tasks. Yeah, let me, maybe let me just add here. Um, I think for us as a company, being around 70 people now, so a bit larger, um, for us, the, the, the first management layer obviously is really important um, where, where those folks are really deeply integrated with their teams and really are um, getting you know, frequent briefings on a, on a weekly basis on where the, their team specifically is, is standing. Um, and then this can be reported directly up to, to the CEO level, right? And um, I think for the corporations, that's really important that you have these type of um, decision makers that really also know the process and know where their specific teams are, are standing, that those decision makers are always also on in the, part of the discussion with potential vendors like startups like such as us. Yeah, awesome. And I think kind of staying in line with the pandemic here, I look at the solutions I have in front of me, things like automation, things like sales automation. Have you guys, now that we have this more remote world, seen any new use cases pop up that have been really interesting based on um, everybody being away from the office? I don't think any new use cases have popped up for us here at Click. I think that a lot of teams are just getting more comfortable with this work from home environment and starting to get more comfortable with using technologies. I know everybody has probably got the Zoom fatigue already uh, from how many Zoom meetings they've been doing, but a lot of teams are getting more comfortable speaking from the sales side of things, uh, engaging their customers remotely, um, whether that is through a video call or sharing content with them and, and seeing data um, like at Click, how, how they can follow up with them. So. Uh, I think that not necessarily new things, but teams getting much more comfortable uh, in adapting to the, this work from home environment. I, I think for us at Automation Hero, we actually see quite significant changes, um, right? Because really being able to automate all sorts of complex um, unstructured data um, involving processes, a lot of companies, a lot of customers are starting to think about what they can actually automate that they hadn't automated before, right? And and if they haven't started it, or if they haven't started thinking this way through COVID, they did it before, but COVID definitely accelerated the process, right? So we see a lot more processes, um, you know, especially in, in customer contact, um, as, as Paul pointed out here already, what, what those guys are, are doing. Um, but, but then, um, you know, any kind of um, communication through contact centers, any type of documents that all of a sudden can be can be automated, data extraction from you know super complicated documents, handwritten documents, et cetera, et cetera. So, a lot of this stuff is is fairly new to the fairly new use cases to the to the simple automation world that are now becoming way more complex. Awesome. Well, I know we are running a little bit short on time here. So maybe one thing to finish this off on a high note, I would love if y'all could maybe give us some advice for other startups in the room looking to work with these large corporations that you've seen some success with. What do you see as like the best learning you could pass on to them to work with these larger corporations? I think there's three things for me. Identify a clear stakeholder, the company you're working with. Identify a clear challenge that you're trying to solve. And, I, and I'd and i say start small and local. I think those are three things that we've done really well here at Click um, and have seen success with. Adding on to that, bring some patience because <laughs> um, those those guys are also very busy and um, oftentimes they talk to you know, a multitude of vendors. Um, and even though, and they are very interested in you, otherwise they wouldn't be talking to you, but you know, corporate processes are much, much slower and take more, more time than startup processes. Yeah, I think that's the one I would agree with is uh, just things take, things take time and um, yeah, be ready for that. Yeah, I would say equip your champion with everything that they need in order to you know, sell and work with their team further, because I think that, you know, when you're dealing with larger companies, there's so many different stakeholders, so many different things happening that, you know, the more you equip your champion and they understand exactly the pain points you're going to be solving, the better that they can help you and your company expand within that, that company. Awesome. Well, thank you all for these words of wisdom. I think this is about all we have time for in this Q&A session. So I appreciate you taking the time to dig in a little deeper here and answer our questions. Um, so thank you all um, to sort of transition the room a little bit. 
um, where we'll be headed next is actually having one of our returning startups share a best use case sort of example for us so we can all learn a little bit from them. I'd like to pass it off to Kamal from Rally Metrics to share more. Thank you, Edson. Thank you for having me uh, here today. Uh, so uh, at Relimetrics, uh, we are enabling the, the fourth industrial revolution uh, by making quality inspections, which are still done visually and manually, easy, connected, and insightful. Um, next, uh, we digitize visual inspections uh, and use this data together with machine and process data to close the loop, improving process efficiency for our customers. So uh, quality assurance uh, uh, is a, a critical and a very costly problem across industries. And uh, still today, uh, many QA tasks are performed manually. Uh, quality accounts for a, a large portion of uh, digital transformation investments as uh, manufacturers strive to lower costs, improve quality, and uh, reduce time to market. In addition, uh, manufacturers uh, can uh, uh, dramatically reduce costs such as scrap and rework through automation, uh, out of 1.2 trillion US dollars uh, predicted to be spent on uh, smart manufacturing, 225 billion will be spent on quality automation in uh, 2021. And uh, the top uh, 100 manufacturers would save uh, $180 billion if they reduced the uh, scrap and rework to zero. Next slide. So to ensure uh, consistency in uh, manufacturing, uh, companies uh, must complete uh, quality audits, uh, but assembly quality audits have traditionally been uh, conducted manually. Uh, product inspection done by human operators uh, is uh, resource incentive intensive and uh, prone to human error. Uh, for this reason, businesses are searching for more accurate and efficient quality audit solutions. In addition, uh, quality management is also becoming increasingly difficult uh, due to accelerating production schedules and rising demands for customized products. And manufacturer product portfolios are progressively more complex, diversified, and uh, customized. This requires quality audit systems that can train automatically and quickly on new parts and configurations. So the demand for highly customized products produced at high volume has led to a high demand for uh, QA solutions to ensure on-time product delivery and enable traceability of quality along the supply chain. Next slide. Uh, Relimetrics takes uh, QA automation to a new level and uh, enables real-time inspection of highly customized products. It is a full-stack AI-based video and data analytics software to close the loop in production, enabling zero defect manufacturing. Overall, uh, we are 10x plus more accurate than smart cameras and provide our customers with 99.9% .9 plus anomaly detection. Uh, we are also 7x faster in time to value than uh, smart cameras thanks to Relimetrics uh, being hardware agnostic and self-implementable. And uh, we can also help our customers boost process efficiency by using digitized quality data to reduce uh, process trips. Relimetrics product uh, consists of three modules. Uh, the training module enables customers to easily train deep learning models in-house without any coding or deep learning expertise. The QA module runs trained models with all required interfaces in line and the process module provides full traceability of quality. Next slide. Uh, we offer our customers hardware integration options that they can self-implement or implement through our SI partners. These range from single camera mounts to Gantry robot integrated hardware setups. The same software unifies this all. And uh, uh, next slide. Um, with Relimetrics, uh, reducing scrap and rework to zero uh, is not a dream, uh, but a proven reality. Uh, our technology has been implemented in high volume, high customization manufacturing environments by automating inspections and using uh, digitized quality data. Relimetrics can help companies cut costs and improve productivity. Uh, with our existing customers, uh, we have showcased that productivity improvements are uh, 50 to 80 percent. So on the saving side, one good example which I would like to share with you is our work with HP and Foxconn. Uh, the original uh, engagement with the HPE came through uh, PMP. Um, so uh, it is a known uh, fact that electronic manufacturers operate in a challenging environment. 
Uh, now customers want increasingly specialized uh, product variations in less time and higher quality and meeting this demand for increased product variation uh, can seriously impact the bottom line. Such variability increases warranty costs that in the US currently averages 2.7% of electronic manufacturers revenue. So uh, this means that for every 1 billion in revenue, a company spends $27 million to support its product uh, warranties. So warranty costs uh, kill electronics manufacturers profitability for Relometrics, computer vision is the cure. Now in this slide, uh, this is why uh, HPE, a leading manufacturer of IT hardware, uh, partnered with uh, Relometrics to modernize and automate assembly processes. A key part of the process it wanted to automate is server assembly quality assurance, uh, which uh, was being done manually by uh, uh, quality operators. So this uh, labor intensive process is prone to error due to human eye fatigue and the inability of quality operators to catch critical defects. Next slide. Um, HPE's portfolio of server products is uh, complex and highly customized. Uh, these characteristics made it difficult uh, to find a machine vision system that could handle the, the product mix. Now, this situation is hardly unusual. Uh, there is a strong demand for computer vision to replace manual visual inspections, yet uh, due to high production variability, particularly in the case of uh, discrete manufacturing, computer vision systems today are not able to keep up with the rate of change in configurations. So to, to address these concerns in the next slide, uh, HP uh, impl is implementing Relometrics machine vision system to automate end of line uh, quality inspections at their server assembly lines. Uh, ReliQA is a proven zero defect manufacturing solution that uses machine learning to achieve a, a high level flexibility and scalability for computer vision systems. Uh, next slide. Uh, with this innovative approach to zero defect manufacturing, uh, we are able to reduce the cost of rework by half a million euros per manufacturing line per year. That is an 80% cost reduction in the company's final testing and rework. What's more, the slow solution slashes the time to pinpoint the root cause of quality issues from days to minutes, and it also reduces the, the defects on arrival by 25%. Next slide. Uh, Relometrics is a practical zero defect manufacturing solution. Uh, the solution can quickly evolve and adapt to changes in production parts and configurations and enable the customer to sustain a, an over 99.9% .9 level of accuracy by filtering inspection results automatically and continuously updating deep learning models at the edge using advanced edge computing technology. Now, the advantage of this approach is the, the reduction of downtime associated with reconfiguring algorithms in high production variability manufacturing environments without any expert knowledge uh, being required. Now, uh, another advantage of uh, uh, Relometrics approach is the ability to leverage data produced at different lines and plants to deliver a comprehensive QA solution for a customer's global manufacturing environment. With Relometrics solution, the learnings from one plant can be immediately shared with another plant in another part of the world. Next slide. Our software is trusted by top manufacturers. Uh, we are working with top manufacturers at the bleeding edge of innovation and digital transformation at scale, competitively beating uh, leading computer vision, hardware, and software companies. Next slide. Our engineering and sales teams are located in both US and uh, Germany, uh, giving us access to two top manufacturing markets, which has been very motivated to automate and reduce costs. Finally, I would like to emphasize that Relometrics is a platform solution. The technology um, we use at Relometrics across use cases is the same, whether we are inspecting uh, mainboard assembly or wealth quality. Uh, contact us at info at relometrics.com to begin your digitization journey with a live demo. Thank you, and we look forward to talking to you. Awesome. Thanks, Kamal, for sharing this case study. This was super insightful, and we appreciate you coming back to join us again and take the time to share this. Thank you. Um, now, to wrap things up, I will pass things back to our MC of the day, Giannis.
Hi, everyone. Sorry for our technical difficulties here. Um, I will just go ahead and um, speak for Giannis and say thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and we will see you all at our networking session on Remo at 1 p.m. Pacific. So looking forward to seeing everyone there and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, guys. One last thing from me, and then I will let you be free. Don't forget to join our real estate and construction summit in just 15 short minutes. So we will see you all there and then at the networking later this afternoon. Thanks, everyone.